first of all, I want to say thanks for coming on. Uh, I pr- really appreciate it. When I when I first got in, um, my first supervisor was Keith Ingram. So he uh, he told me a lot about the Rangers and about you, and uh, it was just, just so fascinating, uh, kind of the things you guys went through back in the day. And and uh, and you, everybody I've ever talked to about you has always had held you in very high regard. And I've only heard great stories about you. So I, I really want to thank you for coming on here. I, I, it's uh, it's an honor to to get to uh, talk to you. Well, thank you. And uh, quick word on Keith, he's awesome troop. Really respected him. Um, you know. I want to say thank you to you and what you're doing and how you're preserving these stories. And I'm nobody. I came into this my way. My buddy Marty suggested uh, you, te- you know, text me, and here we are. So yeah. I uh, really, like I say, appreciate what you're doing. And I, I have, I can't hold a candle to what these guys have been doing the last 20 years since I've been out and. Uh, my hats off and salute them they are yeah. top notch these guys you've had on and guys you have will have on i know for sure so, yeah hopefully yeah this, this is great pres- preservation of our career field which is very well needed yeah that, i thought there there was something lacking you know there was a lot of guys like you and a lot of other dudes that were that are doing great things that nobody either very few people or nobody knows about and i wanted to get those stories out there so yeah, this is and yours is one of them for sure. Yours, I couldn't. I was looking very looking forward to this episode. So, I, like I said, I really appreciate it. But yeah, please tell me uh, if you. I would love it if you'd start from the very beginning of your bio that you sent me. That's okay. fascinating to me. Uh, that I didn't. I had no idea that that was that that was uh, that you started off that way. So yeah, if you want to start loner, from the very beginning. Loner, I guess. I, uh, <laughs> right. I started out uh, left on a church step in Springfield, Missouri. I was. Uh, I estimate seven to 10 days old. There's a note and a ring fastened to this bassinet at St. Anne's Catholic Church. I uh, said, so give my baby to a Catholic family. And uh, the newspaper kind of, the clippings say that there was a lady and a girl over in the diner across the street, watching, sitting at the window, made a phone call. And that phone call, I later learned, I was. After, summer after high school, I was trying to go to Europe, and I got my passport, but I had to get my birth certificate, and I and I saw this Father T.J. O'Brien on my birth certificate, and was like, what the hell? And I'm working as a carpenter's apprentice, and we get this job at a Catholic church, and I see on the sign out front, it says, Monsignor T.J. Thomas J. O'Brien. And one day when he came over looking at our work, I asked him if he was ever in Springfield, Missouri. He said, yeah, that's where I started. And he told me the whole story because whoever made the phone call called the priest and said the church is on fire. So these guys all run out. It's December, or no, January, excuse me. And um, he finds, he's the one who found me on the front steps. And uh, I was taken to an orphanage in Kansas City and adopted by some great, great parents. And uh, since deceased, but you know, they took care of me, gave me a great education, went to Catholic grade school, nuns did some work on me, and then uh, yeah. went to the Jesuits where you really get worked on. <laughs> right. Went to Jesuit high school, very, very high, good education. I, uh, I appreciated everything, great sports programs. We were 72 uh, Missouri State 5A champions in football. Nice. We had a good soccer team, track, blah, blah, blah. So I, I thought about college and went, I don't know. And I started working and didn't go to college at first. And then I started the second semester, uh, which was my first in the winter, at a junior college. And I was working construction, a union laborer first. And I was, uh, you know, back then it was $14.65 an hour. And we're talking late 70s plus two dollars for vacation pay so it's good money and i kind of working through the winter and i (laughs) I didn't attend a whole lot of classes and didn't do really that good but i passed my classes and went on through the summer and school wasn't happening so i ended up working at a bar and the job petered out and i didn't want to travel out this other site 
he just wanted to kick around. Ended up bartending after working the door for a while. And then I decided that it's 24, and I'm like, holy shit, where'd time go? <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. You can only drink so much and party so much, I thought. And then uh, <laughs> I got uh, wild hair because my cousins, too, I'm more firemen. So I said, I'm going to go to the fire department and took the written test, got to pretty much ace that, then did all the physical tests. And right the Friday before, the academy starts, I'm uh, in there for an eye exam and blood draw. And she says, are you wearing contacts? I said, yeah, I've been wearing them the whole time. During, you know, in these, wearing the mask, climbing up steps, hanging from a bar, you know, all the smoke, t- uh, dragging bodies under this wall. But anyway, she says, you can't wear glasses. You can't wear contacts. And I'm going, both my cousins wear glasses. Yeah. Side note there, Johnny, he uh, was driving the fire truck and didn't stop in time and plowed into the fire chief's car and smashed <laughs> the shit out of it. But oh anyway, God. I didn't bring that up. I was like, I didn't want to <laughs> use names. It could get me right to the door out. Right. Uh, I, she said, you can't. And I said, I want to see the fire chief. I want, I want it from the horse's mouth. So I go up to the city hall up there and uh, this guy... He comes to the door after a knock, and he must be 6'5", 6'7", lurch-looking dude, scary-looking dude, and Coke bottle glasses that <laughs> just, I'm like, what is this? And I, yeah. He says, that's, that's the rules. You just got to be a 2020 to come in. I said, why do you? Yeah, and I, I talked with him with you, and it didn't, to no avail. So I went back bartending, and still i'm running and working out and you know trying to keep in some decent shape and uh mainly sweating out the alcohol from the night before is that right <laughs> but uh went on to uh the air force recruiter he said talking to this guy and i took the asbab and scored enough to mark he said pick any well first he said the fireman which is what i came to do firefighter fireman on base it was an 18-month wait. Jesus. I, I mean, anything could happen in 18 months that detour me from the whole thing. Sure. And I said, uh, what else do you got? And he tosses me the AFSC book and said, hey, you scored enough. You pick anything in here. Pick what you want. And uh, I said, okay. And I'm flipping through. I'm spending a lot of time. I think he wanted to get out of there. But <laughs> yeah. I, I finally came up on this radio operator, maintenance driver, AFSC 275XO. And said, what's this? It looks pretty cool. And, uh, you know, just having a Jeep, being outside in austere conditions. And I love that word. I, and I said, <laughs> since years later, I'm like, oh, man, this is, a, I don't like that word anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in too many right. austere conditions. So I picked it and. He said he had a guy that came in just recently, he put in and had a black beret. I have no idea who this was in Kansas City, Missouri in 1979 summer. And, and he said he had a black beret and loved it. Okay. Huh. I uh, I tried to find out who it was once I was in, but never could get that story straight. But, yeah. Um, went, uh, went into basic down at uh, Blackland and I kept... It gave me time you could run on your own. At that time, the show, I had a, a running route, and I, I kind of I went for the CCT, Fair Rescue, uh, reeled me in, and I was like, run it. They gave me some extra time to prepare for that. And uh, I was running, and at that time, I'd go around the hospital and come back up onto the main base, and uh, that was when the Shah of Iran was there. More on that later, but the... the uh, <laughs> You know, the roads were closed, there were guards everywhere, couldn't get there. So that swimming was my big downfall. The running and pull-ups, chin-ups, all that was nothing and, and to me. And, but that swimming, I just couldn't hang. And so I stuck with my AFSC 275 and uh, went on and headed to Keesler for my first assignment after basic to uh, uh, just 
think we combined the class. I'm going to have some troubles here because Warren, I have a TBI and I've had concussions and I don't know, at 69 years old, I'm, uh, I don't know what to say. Yeah, no, no, for I sure. I understand. To totally. Stuff. It was a long time ago, for sure. Yeah. I barely remember what I did yesterday, let alone, you know, right. 30 years ago, right? 40 years ago. Uh, so I'm, I'm at uh, Keesler and my girlfriend came down and they had an apartment right off base. There quite a bit during lunch hours and any free time, and <laughs> we got Byron Dormeyer was in my class, and he'd run with me over there. We had a place under the fence. We we kept <laughs> these brambles or tumbleweeds or whatever stuck in this hole that we'd go under the fence and get right down to the apartment <laughs> half a block away, versus all the way around the base to get out of there. All right, all right. Uh, we never got caught, but anyway, we the class. Grew. I, I'm not sure how this went down exactly. We, we mixed two classes and moved on to Hurlburt after doing the, all the radio electronics at Keesler. And okay. then there was a wait there. I think there was somebody behind us. Again, I don't remember how the classes combined, but you know, this that was uh, those barracks were like the Animal House movie. I mean, we had yeah. refrigerators with beer in it. There was remember that a bunch of beds were tossed out of windows and piled up and people were jumping <laughs> off the second story onto oh them. God. I mean, it was just a riot. And uh, yeah. I, I think Mel Henshaw, who later became PJ, was my roommate, good dude. Um, I'm trying to think of anything other than school that went on that was exciting at Hurlburt during that time, <laughs> other, than that, other than I wanted to get permission to go on this, uh, the SAS was doing a training. They had the uh, boxcar helicopters, and I had to go over to First Sow to get a permission thing or something to go up with them. And they're reading off names. Admin people were constructing medals, and the people that died in the ran hostage had just happened. The failure just happened, and uh, it was pretty sad in there. And I, I, I felt it. I mean, it was like I'm not part of it, but I, I, I read these names and getting paperwork together for. Uh, it's sad, but yeah. Anyway, that I did go out with them and in a sky crane, and <laughs> I worked with them later on down the road too. But uh, it yeah, was yeah. a good, good time to be out and learning what jumping was about because. It's getting ready to go to jump school as soon as uh, tech school ended. And, uh, did that, did jump school. Six of us went. Can't remember all the names. I know Greg, uh, Greg Mosley, uh, Jeff Staha, who was went okay. on to be a CCT officer. Toby Sutherland, some other guys that from the debt. Rich Hosford. Yeah, a lot of debt one guys from Bragg went on to Bragg, and I went on to Shaw. And Shaw okay. was, uh, you know, was. I guess it was 81, I don't know, jump school was 80, so it's still 80. I'm at Shaw. The weird thing about my assignments, they're like every two years, and it was, I kind of, well, I'll get to that later. I, I, I go to Shaw, it was my first duty station, and, and uh, great bunch of guys. Again, it was pretty wild back in those days. It was not the restrictions that, I'm sure the guys have now, but uh, oh yeah, I, if if I say now, I'd be out or in jail. <laughs> the things we <laughs> right. were doing is, just, um, you know, those guys there. I had good supervisor. I I got into this section called special, um, not special operate, special something. Or not, it'll come to me. But Robert Scott Scotty was in it, and Kim Allen, the three of us. And I'm like, so my job, <laughs> I'm making these damn uh, tank targets to put out in the MOA using electric conduit and arc welding them together. Okay. They're stick welding. I'm sorry. And uh, I'm like, uh, somebody to teach me how to use this stuff. Uh, so <laughs> I'm out there all summer making, connecting tubing and making these fake looking tanks. And then they covered them with uh, green canvas. And they put yeah. them out in the MOA for working the A-10s out of Myrtle and F-16s and our F-4s occasionally at Shaw F-4s. It was a, it was a wild job. 
but mainly in the deployments that from there was always uh, FTX's, uh, I support the 82nd, go up to Bragg's. I knew a lot of those guys and Doug Tillman, uh, uh, just a you know, super guy. He is smart. Everybody up there was open arms. Uh, the chief did a great job supporting me every time I came up. I went up for Gallant Eagle, which was, I don't know if is it happened any bigger than that one, but you know, there was uh, 59 141s, 29 C-130s. I don't know how many tons of cargo. We had 18 or 1,900 jumpers in the air. The winds, I, I mean, there's two drop zones, gold and silver, or silver and gold. I don't know which one came first, but that smoke was hauling ass when I got to the door. I'm like, this is not <laughs> going to be good. <laughs> so I went out to 41, and those winds were way out. Apparently, the general said, hey, go with it. It's too big a machine to turn around now. And so oh my God. we executed it. Well, five guys died and 150 were critically wounded. Um, my ALO, I, 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 I did fine. I had to pull my release on my chute to, to, to collapse it. But I'm looking for my ALO and my mark. They threw a, a, a Jeep out. Mark 107, and uh, I find this trail over this little rise of shaving kit and soap and just, <laughs> just some clothes, and I hear this, ah, I'm yelling his name, and he's like, ah, I'm over here, I'm over here. <laughs> he's laying there, his shoot is collapsed, he released too, but he, I guess, got drugged pretty well, and his rock got this ripped open and then being drugged. <laughs> oh, my God. Was that. I get him up and he goes, we got to find that mark. I need a beer. And I'm like, we need a beer out of here. We're Fort Irwin in the desert because we're going to face ops. I'm like, okay, sir. We find the mark and drive, get it all unpacked, drive in. And uh, he is, uh, we go to the face ops first and, and uh, they were talking the medevacs and what planes is, is a big, tall, good looking blonde pilot. And I think she was a captain or major and she's, ordering these guys i am taking these wounded and the dead out of here whatever i can pack in that 130 is going out of here and we're like okay yeah, good honor one place got out of there went over to the shop at bought a six pack <laughs> God. i'm like sir i just don't want to be i'm just i came in with two stripes i don't want to lose them we're you know, I'm still right. over my first year and uh so we had the beers and, and uh, we meet up with our unit, ditch the empties. And uh, I think it's the second God. or third night. We were out there a month, the second or third night. And I'm listening on HF radio to, uh, I've always had different channels, BBC, the Pope's channel. The, so I'm listening to BBC and I think it's an old time broadcast. The Navy's fight, you know, this warship is battling off the Falkland Islands and I'm like, who the hell's the Falkland Islands? And it right. and then it they said and an exorcist met and I'm like, oh exorcist missiles fired. This is modern day. This is, and I go, hey, our first sergeant, the commander, my love I said, anybody know where the Falkland Islands is? And nobody knew. And uh, they go I said, the British are <laughs> having a war there, but and uh, so I put on speaker and we listened and got some scoop on what was really going on in the outside world. Other than that, you know, I was doing FTXs and, and uh, you know, that was a good one. And, and uh, a lot of trips working A-10s down in Charlie Moa in South Carolina, bringing them in on myself. It was, you know, nothing like these guys. Oh, my God. I have so much respect for all these guys the last 20 years. I can't name names. Uh, I, I'd leave somebody out if I even started, so I don't want to. Um, but include everybody you've had on. But yeah. you know, it was a good assignment at Shaw, and, and uh, I learned a lot. Got in bar fights, and we ran the NCO <laughs> club. Got a pool cue across my shoulder. I got busted. But not the pool cue, my collarbone. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of put me back a little bit and it, they didn't set it right and I had to re-break it like Jeez. friends in there with her she had a handful of uh, Percocet 
think it wouldn't let me have any pain pills. He sits me on a little stool and pulls my shoulders back to snap it open and me oh, tell him God. when it's open. <laughs> oh. So I said, yeah, you got it. You got it. I heard it. He goes, I heard it too. And so it never really was perfect, but it's close enough. And calcium filled it in later. But yeah, she's popped four of those Percocets in my mouth and had the bottle handy in case <laughs> we need these later. That was the only injury happened there. A lot of jumping. We did a lot of CH3 jumps. We did air shows. We did uh, with simulated airstrikes uh, you know, going on and good, good time, good, good learning experience with all the equipment. And then I got orders to Korea and I said, I'm a jumper. I'm right not going. And, and I, here I am. I'm 25 now, and I'm two striper, and I'm uh, oh, I got below the zone. So now I have three stripe. I get below the zone ninth ninth Air Force. Yeah, and uh, so I'm three stripe. But still, I'm like, nah. I'm like, I'm not going to Korea. I'm not going to Korea. And I called. I think it was Doug Akers was that who I called. He was in Panama. Pretty sure it's Doug again. Um, but anyway, I got an assignment, moved to jump slot in Panama. So oh, nice. Packed up and went to Panama. Panama was great. A lot of good assignments there. I worked. I was with the sign the third of the seventh SF over Fort Gulick on the other side of the canal. So I wasn't on Howard much, but I did hold a room there. It was like a storage room, really, that the bunk and a locker. <laughs> Later, when Fort Gulick closed, I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, back to Gulick, uh, working with those guys, worked countries all over, deployed. Got my ALO and I had a, a meeting to go meet at this. You know, a lot of people in Panama, it was a, during uh, World War II, was a uh, U.S. territory that there was battle and placements and, and a lot of big bunkers for artillery that protected the coast and anything coming or going. So you get this meeting out in the jungle in one of these uh, revetments or bunkers, whatever you want to call it, and uh, it's with the Delta team. My boss goes, I don't know if we're in the right place, but they told us here. And first off, you know, the guy introduces himself. It's the group, and uh, mainly Maelo and myself. And he goes, how many of y'all know how to ride horses? Said, yeah, shoot, yeah, but on my life. And so my boss goes, I'm going to go to the Jeep out front. I'm not listening to another thing that goes on with these guys <laughs> here on your own. And again, I'm just I'm sent off on, uh, on my lonesome with these guys. We did a, a, an operation in the jump in in Columbia, and uh, it's about as much as I want to go with that one but it was uh, okay a hell of an experience and met these guys that got you know spent a week with them i always wonder what what happened to them later in life but yeah. you never know and hopefully the best so that was a good part of the assignment um uh, with sf guys you know i was always long haired and, and uh, they took me down to the canal a couple times they do uh they pretend like they're boating well i'm not going to get into that either because ships going okay. through but i <laughs> right, i right. was always kind of on the edge or over and uh the uh we we're at a party one you know, saturday afternoon or night evening and my halo and another halo comes over hey come down come outside downstairs because every all the houses were two-story or three-story and the garage was underneath and open so anyway he got downstairs and he goes you know what grooming is? And I'm like, oh, I'm checking my mustache, which is always <laughs> like on the fringe when I'm at work. Right, right. I try to keep it somewhat. And uh, no, not that kind of grooming. He goes, uh, we're, we're putting you in for strike for exceptional personnel. And I'm, me? Uh, okay. <laughs> and it actually, I don't know how this works. It, supposedly I got it, and then the wing commander said I was always out of reg and I don't deserve it. And so really, I, yeah, it just, you know, just went nowhere. And I'm like, man, eh, my own worst enemy again. So I guess just because I'm at my grooming, he didn't, 
you know, mustaches were out then. Uh, the World War, yeah. I mean, the uh, Vietnam War guys, the pilots, uh, they still in the 70s had them, but by 80, psh, they were cut off. And uh, uh-huh. I, uh, I guess I rubbed him the wrong way or whatever. My commander, he, he didn't like me because I had a girl in my room. And a couple times I had that happen, but it, he was just not fond of me. And to prove it, I was, uh, we have a field day. It's like you do a triathlon, each unit sends people in. And my, I did, I was right up near the top of everything. And then it was down to swimming. If I win this swimming meet, we win. And he's like walking on the side. He's all oh, buddy, buddy. Come on, J-Mac. Come on, J-Mac. And I'm, I'm beating the water and I'm, I won and we won. The letter of appreciation had everybody's name but mine on it. <laughs> My alien sent it back to him with a hand scribble note. It, it, it said something to, you know, don't forget to give J Mac a pat on the back. Nobody called me Sergeant McKay. It was like ridiculous. It's like, yeah. who am I? I don't know. I'm just some guy you send <laughs> off. I'm like Mikey in the old life cereal commercials who eat anything, you know, when you tell them, <laughs> send me on my way and do whatever needs to be done. And, but he, he says, hey, remember to give J-Mac a pat on the back. He was instrumental there. And it's like, I got squat from that guy. But uh, that's It's so weird I, how he had a hang up with like, your your job performance was stellar, but then he had some hang up with some personal things and he t- held that against you. It's yeah, so weird. It's, I don't, I don't it's get funny how that. people think and work. I, I'm easy going. I've, I, I didn't cause a stir. And it, it happened to me numerous times in my career. Anyway, life's too short to, to get uh, uptight about stuff or hold a grudge. I, I, you know, when I got hit by this drunk driver eight years ago, when I finally came to and they and I'm innovated and tied down, I don't know where I'm at. I come out of this coma and I'm trying to fight and I actually thought I was abducted by aliens and, and I had no <laughs> idea because I was on my motorcycle just cruising up into Tucson and this drunk driver hits me. Well, the nurse comes in and tells me immediately what happened. I lost my lower left leg and I'm going I, Monday, I have an appointment for injections of Synvift, the synthetic cartilage. It's just pure bone on bone arthritis, and, and they do it every three or four months, give me that injection. And I've got a mouthful of tubes, and I'm trying to say, oh, cut my leg, my <laughs> knee off. <laughs> but they couldn't understand anything, and I'm drugged out of my mind. And but in my head, I'm like, that knee is no good. Why don't you just cut that off? And But. I am so glad that they did not because people with uh, above the knee amputees use 110% more energy than just regular walking leg or their normal leg. Oh, really? There. And you're 60% more energy you use for below the knee amputees. Okay. So, uh, I, I, I'm glad I have it. I had a knee replacement, which is a, in that with an inch and a half of tibia, it was a, a game changer for the company that makes knees because they never have done that and they had to take months and months and CAD drawings for my x-rays and my MRIs and came up with the knee then my doctor had to practice with it uh, uh, what she's going to do how she's connecting it and practice doing it she did it good job yeah Yeah. running blade which I don't really run I don't use it much It's, it's it's uh some issues and i had to get my other knee done all good um so that kind of like blazed the trail for that yeah for that blow or the, for that knee thing yeah it was pretty interesting it was a write-up they did a paper on it and stuff and neat uh, i got a I, I got the model somewhere i don't know she gave me the practice <laughs> <laughs> uh, um i got sidetracked i think i'm still in panama i don't know Stripe. Yeah, yeah. Stripe. Oh, yeah. You're talking about how you're you were up for a step promotion, but then they ah, said yes, no. Yes. Yeah. But oh, I already got on that tangent about holding grudges and 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 things like that. When she told me what happened, the guy's drunk. I'm saying, God, in my mind, I'm praying, God, please, you take care of him. Let the police take care of him. But God, get me out of this hospital fast. 
please. Yeah. I want to get healed and get out of here. And remarkably, uh, I they, they they were pretty impressed how fast I progressed and and what I was able to do and keep going. And I think if I wasn't in such good shape back then, eight years ago, that well, it, it even says in my medical records in, in the trauma center, this guy had been toast. I didn't say that, but they said, oh really? It, if he wasn't in such good shape, they had to put four four and a half liters of blood, but I mean, that's four and a half oh, liters man. is like no blood left. And when the right, cop, right. cop saw me and my leg up the street and I'm all bloody and shit, I'm all twisted up. My head's open, scalp is degloved oh. off my skull. And, and oh my he's, God. He, he calls the district attorney for a uh, vehicle and homicide. But a witness had gone around the other side of this Chevy collar. This is an old Chevy Colorado I'm trapped under and twisted up under. And... I kept getting the feeling they said down the street well, it was like it wasn't far at all. I didn't. I mean, I had gear burned off and, from road rash and and, and not much road rash at all. And and what I did have healed, I look at his split, and um, so it wasn't very far that I was drugged. But had my bike oh not my been God. hooked to the truck, also it wouldn't have pulled him into the curb and stopped him. So the good oh. part is it, it did stop him, and he. 0.28, 74 year old man. And, oh man! Uh, but back to originally about why I don't hold grudges. Is that one, it eats the hell out of you. You can't get rid of it. You think of it all the time. So holding grudges and vengeance, I just I, yep, let God have it. When I was in that hospital room, I said, "You take it, get me out of here." And uh, so, through my career, I've never held a grudge on anything that anybody. They didn't like me. They didn't want to promote me. Okay, they got their reasons, and they're the head chicken fucker. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Pardon me. But uh, they, uh, they're the man that writes the check, I guess I should have said. Right, so, right. I'm, uh, you know, just disappointed, but like I said, not got to move on. There's stuff to be done. Yeah. But well, you didn't time. waste your time dwelling on it. I mean, you got other stuff to do, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah. mission comes first. And good, good gig there. We're all over Central and South America. I worked with a lot of foreign troops teaching uh, close air support to English speakers. Kept saying, send me to Spanish school up at my, at, you know, at Fort Ord at Monterey. No, you don't need Spanish. Everything's done in English. And I'm like, we go to these safe houses and what? I don't know if the guy that is on the street, if I'm going to get a Coke or whatever down the street, what this guy's saying, you know, it could be. Right, right. And, uh, um, but, nah, nothing ever happened. And I really I guess I didn't need it. So, um, was there, eight, that, again, two years I was there. This will be going on, well, two years there. Great guys to work with there. I could say that. Got A7 rides. We had the two-seater guard was rotated out of there and they had two seater a sevens and of course the o2s oh, yeah, yeah. fam rides and all that out to the ranges oh cool <laughs> we're out we're out over the water um the guy's great this dude he, he, anyway we're out and we over sailboat he said you see that girl on that boat she's laying there with no top <laughs> on and i go ah you're kidding no I, i'll show you we go around and i get you know, I can't see over the nose of the aircraft. And so right. he inverts and goes over and I'm looking down, I'm looking up, <laughs> but looking down and uh, sure as I, I go, yeah, all right. <laughs> so, What'd they do? What do they, uh, I mean, they have any kind of reaction when you guys flew over? No, we were high, high yeah. enough. We didn't get, we wouldn't oh, blow okay. past, but you could see her on the deck and she moved. That was one thing that she, oh, yeah. she, she <laughs> Probably thought something the first time we went over, and, and uh, all right, right. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just I, I keep going back to you know, why am I uh, on this podcast? I wish I had some more stories that uh, these guys have, but yet again, I, I just got a lot of respect for these guys, and I, I just don't feel I'm in the position to be rubbing shoulders here with them on their on, on this podcast. But, 
Well, see, that's the thing about guys like you and guys like Marty, and you guys are all real humble, and you, you're, and that's what's the best thing about you guys is that you're, you, you're these, you know, quintessential badasses that don't look for recognition, you don't look for any kind of like, you know, you know, you know, toot your own horns, and to guys like us, you, we've looked up to guys like you, you know, you, you, you trailblaze the way for everybody else is doing with their job right now. I mean, you, you got, especially you, you know, guys like you and Keith and. And Marty and Roger Cross, you know, yeah. and, you know, your name is you guys were like some headliners yeah. there, man. <laughs> heavy hitters. I know you guys all were. And we were all we were all you were already legends when we got in. So we're you know, you we look up to guys like you because for setting the standard. I mean, that's that's uh, we wouldn't be anywhere without guys like you. So, I, I mean, yeah, I, you. yeah, for sure. I uh, got my next assignment. I, I wanted to go up to the uh, Ranger Battalion. Scotty was there. Uh, Kim Allen. Uh, you need to talk with Robert Scott. He's a Grenada Raider, and uh, but there's only two oh, two two assigned slots for uh, the rain, OLA for the at Hunter Army Airfield, the first bat. So I had to go to Fort Stewart Air Force <laughs> Unit there, and uh, God, that, I thought it was Det One Five Zero Seven, but that's up at Bragg. So maybe it's Det Two. Anyway, uh, I was stationed there. Had some great guys there, supervisors and, and guys that were there, but you now they're all uh, non-airborne and, and I kind of let that go to my head that I was and, and uh, doing PT, kind of pushed it and <laughs> just get... anyway, uh, all was good, uh, made a lot of good friends and, and uh, God, I, I'm not going to try and name names because I'll sit here stumbling. <laughs> they went on to do bigger and better things. Um, flight leads that I had there and but I was still augmenting with the Rangers when there was some a need for a third Italian movement they each company had somebody so I'd get to go over and work uh, with Scotty and uh, Kim Allen Kim Allen I, I don't know if you know him he's since passed cancer but he uh, was in Vietnam a, a CCT he was the last when when they were on the embassy, when the, the famous helicopters are putting people on. He's the last American or serviceman there to get out of there. He was loving really? birds and controlling the helicopters in and out and trying to keep the people at bay that were on the roof to get on it. Uh, wow. But, uh, yeah. He, and he was he was stationed well. there at first bat with, with those guys? Yeah, yeah. He, and okay. Big skydiving dude and uh, wild, wild guy. And when it when it was Shaw and I worked with him, I'd take him home after the after the uh, club. Uh, it'd be seven eight o'clock, and we started at four. So, um, <laughs> and right. so he'd say, "Wait here." She gets testy if I'm late for dinner, and I'm already an hour and a half late. It's so like, <laughs> what am I waiting for? Well, she has a right. machete, and she's a Filipino girl what? that he was married to. <laughs> Sweet as a god, I, I couldn't see it. But man, I hear it, and I'm like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> Better unlock the door, have the door open, maybe. But he never ran out. I could just hear him getting chewed out from the driveway. So, uh, but he was a great dude. Yeah, he was a wealth of information. But back to uh, working at, at, at Fort Stewart, enjoyed it, learned a lot. I was there maybe eight or nine months. Again, a barracks issue with girls and commanders comes in and I'm still in bed with should be I think at work or PT or something and they did a <laughs> spot inspection and I think it was PT oh, yeah. and I didn't go because I had business <laughs> yeah you're busy <laughs> and, uh, he kept well you're gonna bring her name was Susie you're gonna bring Susie to the Christmas party and I liked her and I'm like oh god <laughs> no no, no. <laughs> Uh, I didn't get any reprimand or anything, but it was, it was testy there for a bit. And uh, yeah. it was only PT I missed. It wasn't a major, thank God. But I ended up finally, uh, I, I rented a house close to Hunter Army Airfield out on the marsh, this big plantation. I rented the guest house and I was going back and forth. But I, and then I got the third slot finally, and which was great. And I'd ride the bicycle in, throw it over the fence at Hunter to make a shortcut, ride it in, and 
right at home. It's 12 miles each way and uh, 12 miles, 24 total. And, and then uh, our PT in the morning, I'll have to say the reason I was doing that had lost my driving privileges on base. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll just leave it there. Uh, okay. The, uh, so it was not a, Hey, I'm going to do this for me. You know, my right, right. welfare, <laughs> I did it because of necessity. <laughs> Uh, I threw that 10 speed over the fence so much. I was surprised it held together as many times as I chucked it over the fence. It's like I got my deadlift exercise in and my throwing it up okay. over this chain link fence with barbed wire points. <laughs> then I had to climb it. And, oh, gosh. Things I do. That's awesome. Yeah. But, uh, that was a good assignment from the day one. I mean, it was, we had a little office. That was one of the things that, I mean, it was a closet, and it was so crammed yeah. in there. Was, if you got three people, you couldn't get three people in there. Just the ALO would go and hang out with the S3 shop, and, and there just wasn't room in there and, and our gear. And yeah. So we did get a new, not a new building, a new part of a building. And But during that time, I'd go over to Fort Stewart, and that's when I met Marty, and uh, I don't know what it was that he – he wanted to be at the Rangers. He said, who are these guys? Or who are, he came up to me, who are you guys and what do you do? Because I made everybody, had, including the ALOs, everybody had to do pull-ups before we go into the office. They had a pull-up bar right at the steps before you go in. For the uh, ad, our, All of our admin was conducted out of there. And uh, Anyway, Marty goes, who are you guys and what do you do? And you know, we've got OG 107s and Spitshine boots, starched and black gray on. And, Told him, hey, we're at the Ranger Battalion, and uh, he goes, I want to, I want to do this, and we became friends. Told him he needed to go to airborne school first, and got him over there. Told him what we do. Gave him PT. I think I gave him a PT test. I'm sure I did. I, I, it's kind of my <laughs> thing. But uh, guy, talk about a stud. And then, and Roger was over there. Roger is a cool dude. He, he knew his stuff. And man, yeah. Try it, come on over. And end up being those two and myself. And uh, I'll tell you what, those guys left me in the dirt. They just, you know, <laughs> later in their career, boom, they went to the sky. I mean, especially Marty. Oh, yeah, they... yeah, great guy. We did a lot of piling around. I got a lot of respect and love for that guy. Why, uh, ALOs, you know, they would change every 20, 24 months. And, Mm -hmm. always, it's like it, in Panama, some of them knew everything. We had a big group of them there. And some of them would go, man, just don't get me killed. Tell me what I need to do. <laughs> Whatever. You know, just tell me what we're doing. Because in Panama, yeah. it's also J JOTC, I augmented for the units that came down. And, and the ALOs go, eh, I went, I've done it once. I don't want to go again. You just take care of it. And so I'm the... I, I got to be where I didn't need a map. I knew where everything was and how to call the air right. work with the guys and support for JOTC. And, uh, but back to the Rangers and, and uh, the ALOs were super. They, they were all airborne qualified. And when Major Sutley and Major Jones was a, ah, I jumped the gun. Gosh, dang it. Pardon me. Before Marty and, and, uh, and Roger came over. It was Keith Ingram and uh, Tom Kotcher. Gosh, I can't believe okay. I jumped that. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, Keith, solid troop, knew his stuff inside and out. Tom, the same way. We, uh, you know, did everything the Rangers did, and road marches. And we didn't do all their PT back then. And, uh, yeah. That came later. And uh, we did our own. And uh, I'm married at this time, Donna. Her, I, her three kids, they were two, four, and I want to, when I met them, I think they were two, four, and six when I lived out at that house on the, in the, on the plantation. And, uh, we got married. I think they were four, six, and eight by then or something. But okay. anyway, I'm also, it's, it's Donna's teaching aerobics on base, a couple classes every okay. afternoon. Rangers go in there, get smoked, never come back. Right. <laughs> they tell me, God, I don't know how she does it. I go, she does three classes. She does one at Gulfstream midday and two here in the afternoon. And Insane. I go, I, I can't do it. I do it <laughs> once every other week. <laughs> I just show. 
show up. But, uh, so anyway, Roger, I mean, uh, pardon me, uh, Keith Ingram and Tom Cotts are there. And that's uh, Keith, uh, Major Sutley, and Major Jones, and myself as a jump master, won the Shaw Jump Fest, which was Army, Marines, and Air Force. Nice. During that fest. And uh, that was a big plus and excitement for us. It's always a uh, you know, friendly camaraderie with all the jumpers. And yeah, yeah. And as always, a Budweiser front comes in. And all right, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, good times. Good times. Uh, yeah, Keith was my uh, first supervisor when I came in the military. Like, so I, from the get, I, in, ingrained in me was that mentality you guys had. So it was. He's real fortunate that I, I had him as a supervisor. He was, he was great. Oh, yeah. He's yeah he a, talked about you, guy. and, yeah, it was just, yeah. He's a was, tough dude. He's a tough guy, man. He, yeah. He's uh, got a lot of respect for him and his knowledge also. For sure. We, we've piled around. I, we'd meet up at Sturgis, go to his house up there, stay there, link up. He's over in St. Louis now. He, I think we talked back in – Right after Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's, I think it was. We were talking. Okay. Yeah, I miss that guy. He's, he's, he was around with Don and I a lot. And when I was like a company was doing something or I needed some help, he'd be over at the house. The kids loved him, had a nice. blast with him. Um, same with Marty and Roger, same thing. You know, they, they all respect. They grew up around the Rangers. I mean, they saw everything. They were on the airfield when we returned. We always jumped back in and up yeah. on the hunter. And that was always a good time. But back to military and uh, hunter with uh, Marty and Roger. Let's see, who was the next? Hey, look. Gary Luck, Major Luck came in. Yeah. And somebody. Oh, I wanted to say one more thing about Major Sutley. He was uh, Army ROTC in college okay. for flying F-4s, but he went to Ranger School during ROTC. Wow. And during, he got, he, he was instrumental in me getting that slot at 187, class 187, winter 87. And uh, we were the only, and he pinned my, my tab on. He, get, he gave me a tab that I kept and all through Ranger School and, uh, I went through, I think he sailed through that. But him and Colonel Stevens, a wing DO, were the only chain of command in the Air Force Ranger qualified. And, wow. And it just made the base newspaper, but we were all standing there with our <laughs> tabs showing. And Colonel Stevens was Stevens or Stevenson? Stevens. And, and he was a, a Green Beret in Vietnam. And wow. got a, a F4 pilot, went back and fought. Jeez, that's there. awesome. He jumped with us all the time. and who I do yeah. yeah no doubt um so go on to to, to uh major Lexi Alo, and i can't remember who we had a second thing god what's wrong with me i guess we didn't for a while i, I i'm not sure how that worked out with one alo but you know we had each of us signed to a company as alpha and marty was bravo and roger cross was charlie anyway so you know, we had all these practice deployments. I say practice. We thought it was real world. It was going to be real world. And then you come in and, you know, you experienced it. And I always say somebody made a phone call or somebody paid somebody and they calmed the shit down and <laughs> right. you know, everything was all copacetic. And we go home with our, still got a hard on for going to war and nothing's right. going on. It's like jumping and they say the winds are too high. The door shuts down in front yeah. of your face. And you're like, ah! Oh yeah, sit down and that go stuff. To land. I know it. <laughs> the time it did happen, and uh, we practiced the week before on a, a site, a mount site that was constructed out of uh, just plywood buildings back then. Just it's hastily built, and it's resembling our our airfield that we were going to take. And uh, man, I the last four or five of us got. I mean, it was so it got out. People would be too slow getting out of the plane, and I'm the last guy out. And I, we're way long on the airfield. We're yeah. almost in this forest. Thank God we had flight. The space was big enough to allow for not, not going in the forest. But I, 
when it came down to the real deal at, at Omar Torres Airport, I thought, uh-oh, they have this Ave Maria battalion, they said, is outside. It's all women. And they're outside the fence of the perimeter. And I'm like, oh, man, if I go along this time and I get stuck going, <laughs> a bunch of women shooting at me. And I no. just had all these thoughts of, all right, just start popping grenades, dropping grenades down. That's what's going to happen. And I can't get to my weapon. And yeah, yeah. The easy part of that was with no reserve. And when we back up here that morning, I was scheduled for a root canal. And... They said, hey, you got stuff, you know, people had a pay thing. People had this thing to do and that. We're quarantined on the base, but on Hunter. And I went and had the root canal done. I, I had to. Right? This thing was giving me a fit, and I didn't need to be at altitude and have it burst and whatnot. But sure. anyway, long story short, got through that done. Get out there. It's They're just now doing... I mean, it was a 7.30 appointment, so we've been there way before dawn, and uh, they're issuing ammo. It's raining on us, and it's like 45, 50 degrees, and I'm like, Jesus Christ. This reminds me of ranger school, because it either was snowed on us or rained on us all that time in ranger school. So anyway, we get, get loaded ammo, and, and then all of a sudden, these guys are setting up GP larges, and just some chow and got out of the rain, got on board the plane and I guess they went around, if I remember right, went around Cuba at three or 400 foot above the, over the water to skirt the radar at Cuba. And, and uh, then we went into Panama at 500 and man, I had a perfect jump. I landed a <laughs> foot from the tarmac away from the airfield and the grass hit it. Uh, oh. I'm ahead of myself again. Sorry. I'm, I had the AC 130s. I was controlling pre strike going in yeah. and, ha and had uh, attack helicopters, their mission. I was to contact them once I hit the ground. Coming off that plane, all I could see out of every window is fire. And I'm like, what am I jumping into? <laughs> you know, it's a <laughs> nylon parachute. But, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. The curvature of the airplane. I'm thinking, and I'm on the, I'm monitoring and I'm stretching this handset from the back firewall of the, of the uh, aircraft where the radio was attached all the way as far as I could, let it go <laughs> and ended up out the door. Perfect. No over the fence, no Ave Maria battalion and yeah, and all that, but. And uh, I start making a move off that grass about high, eight, 10 foot. And uh, my chute, plus so I was collapsing my chute. All of a sudden, bam, bam, it just whizzing by me. Shoo, and I could hear it crack. And I'm like, damn, got down, pulled the shit in. Then I think it was, I don't think it's first sergeant yet, Gomez, Sergeant Gomez from Alpha comes up. We're going to the rally point, and these bu bullets are coming, they're snapping right all over us. So I'm getting my radio out. My, we didn't have the reserves, so my weapon's out. Let me see how this went down again. Because I didn't have my chute there. I left it out there in a half ass wadded up bag, tied up and on the ground. And it was no wind. It was hot and humid and no air at all. And it's the 20th, yeah, 20th December. We, uh, we're talking and this bullet flying. I go, dude, I get, I, I'm trying to get my weapon that got it at. I remember Scotty, here's a lesson learned when he was in Grenada and they were pinned down by this guy behind a Jeep. He was ricocheting off the bottom of the Jeep and coming and they were coming up and put him out. Well, this guy, his truck was at an angle to a wall and he's over the hood with the wheel. You know, he's got the engine, the front wheel, and he pops up over the, and I just start banking every third, every third round is a, is a tracer. And I'm just banking those tracers, watching where they go. And man, he stopped firing. Nice. I, and I didn't get to go see what was there or what happened, but there was no more fire. And we made it to our IP or to our rally point, pardon me. And, um, which was down about 10 feet down 
into this Kuna grass sewer. And uh, this one dude's got a bayonet down there fixed. On his what the <laughs> fuck? We're jumping into this, the sliding down, and this guy standing there with a bayonet could have nailed any one of us coming over the top. Oh, my uh, gosh. Put the bayonet away. And he's <laughs> later another. So we do our, we did a clearing. And when I was with third of the seventh SF station there, we used to skydive on the weekends with these very people at this very field. And that is crazy. <laughs> using Air Force, the November model twin engine uh, Hueys that, yeah. that we had there, the gunships we had, and uh, at the squadron in Howard. And uh, I, I got, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, <laughs> we're I'm clearing these buildings and I'm having flashbacks of all the beer I drank here and all the people and whatnot. Anyway. That had to be so surreal that you, I mean, it was, it, was, definitely, you're, you're yeah. not the only guy that was like, cause there were actually tech P station down there too, during that time. So oh, like, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's so saying. weird how, you know, it, it was like at one point you're, you know, you're just, like you said, drinking beer with your buddies down there. And the next minute you're fighting, <laughs> fighting the same guys you're with, you know, or just hanging out with, it's crazy. It was, yeah, that was something. And, uh, come back and they we went through the buildings and, and, did some clearing off to the, toward this motor pool area, come back to the rally point. There was a call for all the alpha assemble uh, on the radio to, to, to meet up at the, this spot. And they had a lot of bodies already piled up. Somebody drug them out and checked to see if they're dead or whatever. But I went over around that truck and all was, there was blood. I don't know if it was somebody got away. There was a lot of blood there or if they drug and he's one of these guys laying it out here on the on the tarmac. Yeah, yeah. I'm no hero. I just thought of what Scotty told me, and I said, "Hell, I'm good at pool. Let me do this." <laughs> <laughs> I used to be good at pool, I should say. Yeah. I've played in ages, but uh, I I uh, get to there, and hey, we're going into Punta Paitia to uh, relieve the seals in place. And you know, they had been shot up and lost a CCT and a four seals, so five dead oh, there. And um, it's just getting to be a little bit light, get on the Chinooks and we go in. These, it's now, it, by the time we got there, it's it, it pretty much dawn. They're coming out. I couldn't believe it. I have, in my pre just cause uh, attack. I've worked with a lot of SEALs, trained them on laser. That was a big forte. We just got these lasers in and we we're training with them and training SEALs and SF, both at Cannon and out at Dugway. And they mm -hmm. always, always had different clothes, different, nobody matched. <laughs> you know, right. The Rangers, everybody knows what's in your ruck and yeah. you, know, you lose something, you know, you, you could reach into the guy's ruck and get what he needs if he's hurt or Sure, whatever sure. and uh, but there's no god these guys came to the helicopter one dude smoking a cigar with bandoliers carrying a saw <laughs> and i was like what the heck is this rambo the sleeves cut <laughs> off he's like a fire he he's still square bodied just muscles out the yin yang and, and yeah, yeah. throws a cigar down gets and comes up on the ramp and goes in and i'm watching all these guys and and they take off and the rangers all dispersed and, and got into sights. We're getting a nothing. That airfield's down low, and I don't know why nobody was shooting at us at the time, but they weren't. But rangers are in uh, positions and, and, and fighting positions. They'd set up here, there, scattered around and, and uh, from the company. And the helicopter took off and touched one of the wheels caught a piece of the wall and oh. knocked it over onto two rangers and thrust, oh, busted, crushed one guy's leg. And oh. so now we need a medevac. <laughs> and so um, um, now I'm on new day's frequencies and we were given, um, um, all of us were given the wrong frequency for that day. And I, my radio was worth PRC 66 worthless yeah. FM wasn't going to get me anything. Um, 113. I didn't have time to set that. 
Oh, no, I didn't have the 113 then. Pardon me. And just the 66 and 77 in my ruck. Jeez. So I, I don't know what my training kicks in, you know, and your stuff was happening. Now we're starting to get sporadic fire. We got a guy down. I got no combo. They want medevac, and I can't get anything going. I commandeered out of the parking lot, which was close to the tower in the office. This place was destroyed. That right, oh God, these seals just went nuts. I guess because they killed, got their people killed or what, you know, whatever happened. Yeah. They destroyed this place. There's a little restaurant in there. They yanked all the food out of the refrigerators. They shot up the generator. They took Noriega's uh, little jet and fired a law into it. And all those big round windows were just blobs of plexiglass melted hanging out of it. And the inside was fired, gutted, and, and worthless Man. now. I don't know what what came over them to just destroy everything there. And they're, and they're the only ones. The, the Coke machines were busted into. The phone, <laughs> uh, the pay phones are off the walls. I, 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 it just baffled me. What? And then later that day, that food from the cafeteria, whatever, that little restaurant, all the refrigerated food was out. That heat, it started stinking bad, oh. bad, bad. But oh back God. to right off, trying to get a medevac and everything. I couldn't get anything on guard. I couldn't do nothing. I, I get two batteries out of the cars in the parking lot. One ranger's with me, carrying one. I'm carrying another. This is an old airport. There's a This is the original airport. And the tower, to get up to it, is a ladder. And Climbing up the ladder and getting shot at. That's when the snipers started. And, you know, rock chips and whatnot splattering on me. And I'm holding the battery and got half empty ruck with me just in case my stuff. I was dragging the radios up there and and uh, going up this ladder, getting shot at it. I'm yelling, somebody take that fucking sniper out. <laughs> I'm yelling down. No, nobody can. I, they don't know where he is either. There's apartment sure, sure. buildings all around. And and uh, so anyway, I get up there and we, we're hunkered down, even though that glass probably was bulletproof around the, the top of it, but I wasn't taking chances. Get in there and I took the two batteries because 24 volt DC yanked wires and connected the radios from the tower together. <laughs> Line it, you know, since there's no generator, no power. Right, right. All those power cables and got Ranger holding some, I'm holding some, and I <laughs> call in on guard first. And uh, I hit this air, Howard Air Traffic Control's got a bunch of planes in the air, and, and he's like, get off this frequency. Whoever, I give him my call sign, and I, I, ain't, I can't even remember what it was, but anyway, he's calling back, get off this frequency get off guard and i go hey here's my situation and i got rangers down i'm at punta paitia i need a medevac and i got bus loads two bus loads of, of uh surges went into this warehouse adjacent to the airport and i don't know that what they're gonna do uh they got guns they're flipping you know they didn't shoot they i didn't tell them all this i'm just explaining now they nobody yeah. shot they flipping the bird yelling and stuff we could you know hear them but Anyway, they went into that. I don't know if they're getting ready to do a attack on us, you know, rush right. us or what. Anyway, I, 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 all of a sudden I hear the, the air traffic controller at Howard. Flight blah 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 blah. Hold it, ten thousand da da da. Flight blah blah. They stacking all these planes, holding them. <laughs> <laughs> he scrambled the two A sevens and a, a medevac helicopter to me. Nice. And I ran those A7s over there. It's just go east to west as close as you can to that metal building. You will fucking make, pardon me. You <laughs> no, will no, make okay. a hell of a lot of uh, noise inside. And, and my experience at Shaw being on the flight line in a metal bu building with that force taken off oh, every yeah. time, you just had to, you know, hold it, hold your ears, stop talking to whoever was next to you. <laughs> it's a, it's a, oh, man, he rattled that their cage a bunch, That those two F, uh, A7s. And, uh, Probably kept them in there, too, if they had any inclination to come out and oh, stir yeah. up any shit. They were, 
They weren't going they anywhere. That they'd get their handed to them. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so that that was the uh, beginning of about a week that I was out. Um, we did some patrols. We hit these houses in the jungle, safe houses. We moved a bunch of cash and, and weapons. Um, then a couple of fisters and myself were assigned to go to this apartment building. It's a luxury building right across from the papal commandancia where the, where Noriega was hiding out. Yeah, yeah. And we had eyes on target, guns on target, Air Force planes ready. Whatever needed to be done was going to get done. And uh, so we stayed in there a day or two nights or two nights or three. I don't remember, but he finally you know, gave himself up and nothing else happened there. And met up back with Marty and Roger back at the, uh, God, I don't know if it was Howard, wherever we met up. I don't know. Can't remember where it was when we rallied the battalion, came back together. But, uh, so did you, when you were on the airfield, so you guys just all kind of, you started, you jumped in. And then you kind of like branched out to different locations or? And then, right, right. Okay, and he, okay. And the, the, it's a, that's an international airport. That first, first battalion jumped into Omar Torreos International Airport. And it is huge. And there's yeah. different objectives for uh, each company in different locations. And Alpha was right in into the buildings, right in the front uh, off the tarmac. And I guess I got that perfect position that time thank god they yeah, <laughs> got out of the plane in time and did what needed to be done and, and we lost one person on one of the aircraft was killed in at the door oh, and man. they pulled him back and everybody continued jumping but damn that's probably Jeez. not something you want to see as you're going out <laughs> yeah and, and he was a medic on top of oh it. man and it was sad but, uh i i uh i yeah, I thought I was jumping into fire, and I could just see my nylon shoe crispy and <laughs> yeah. plummeting in. But it was nothing like that. Uh, imagination in split seconds, what it does, sure. good or bad. But uh, anyway, then you know, we we finished that, got back to to uh, to Hunter Army Airfield, and got home and. Marty's hog was still, it, they, they had taken it down from my, uh, I had a summer kitchen, a screened in summer kitchen with refrigerator and stoves and tables and stuff. And the, the hog he, he shot the day before we left it was hanging and the girls, <laughs> our wives took it and had it, whatever they had it butchered. And he told you that story. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but got home and, uh, it was good to be home, but it was so short lived. It's like, wow, you know, I think of these guys now on these deployments, multiple years of deployments, and I'm like, God, so much respect and uh, to know them and know who they are. That's even, you know, that even more respect. Yeah. But, uh, so Hunter was a good gig and I loved it. Learned a lot. Went to, driving school i learned how to hot wire i learned how to drive heavy equipment the driving schools the deltas up in, the, in north carolina i got to run around and bang up a, you know it looked like a stock car with just a cage and <laughs> it's all crumbled up but uh yeah i learned how to 180 why not do all this stuff that later in rental cars <laughs> yeah right out of uh, alamo <laughs> rental car never again <laughs> enterprise never again yeah, yeah we had we made it in one of those times was <laughs> i know who it was it was it was captain hammer was there with when curtis Sut when Sutley, he was another he was an F f-15 pilot later went on to work for delta airlines but anyway captain hammer back to to, to when he was in ALO with Colonel Sutley, or back, back then, Major Sutley. Um, him and I jumped in with the Rangers at Hunter Liggett out in, in California. And we did these patrols through the mountains all the way to the coast. I don't, you know, we're looking for one, a lot of the marijuana fields that were in there were all booby trapped and, you know, yeah. everybody's going. We're all, it's like being on online to police trash it almost seemed like everybody's <laughs> moving for a day and night a couple i don't know four or five days we finally get to the coast and and uh 
everybody's covered in poison ivy. You couldn't even recognize most people. Our faces were all swollen, oh hands. Oh man, it was it was an ugly one. But I did I didn't have it. Neither did did, did um, uh, Captain Hammer. But uh, we had just a pair of G or civilian clothes because we get R and R, and we're with uh, I don't know which FSO, which fire support officer. I think I remember. Anyway, we're doing streets of San Francisco in a rental car after our R and R. We're going over that, you know, just looked like Bullet, the movie Bullet. Yeah. And, and I'm like, ah, you know, G forces are taking effect, everything, and uh, those cars are never the same. Uh-uh. But uh, we had our jeans and wrinkled T-shirt, and John Hammer's family owns the big in Ohio, big chain of. Uh, liquor stores in fact during prohibition they were the only liquor store that could sell wine and they sold it only to the catholic church or i mean some other churches or some other denomination i don't know but the catholics were their big so um and oh god um what is the name of the very famous winery Uh, maybe it'll come to me up at in uh Tonoma uh county uh, we go to it was it like napa valley well, yeah it? napa valley up in sonoma county yeah I, I think of it in a minute it's a famous brand you know anyway the, they're the oldest because of that catholic church need they're the only winery that w- was open during prohibition oh really they, they were the sole supplier to that catholic so wow. we're in this tour and uh we shook hands with somebody early when we got there and we did the tour and they're in an the auditorium and, and it, they're telling that story about prohibition. And then, and he goes, and we have John hammer, one of the grandsons of, of the man who coordinated all the wine sales to keep our company afloat during prohibition <laughs> sitting in the back. And, you know, we look like Joe Ragbag. I mean, <laughs> yeah. we're looking bad. And, and uh, <laughs> You know, he stands up and they clap and they take <laughs> us to lunch to like this five-star restaurant. People are waiting. Is an hour and a half to get in there. Who waits an hour and a half for lunch? I mean, he must yeah, have, yeah. you know, you, you probably don't work. <laughs> so, right, right. But yeah. You're not on your lunch break for sure. Yeah, <laughs> right. But they waltzed us right in. The guy's carrying two brown bags of his wine. And man, we had a feast and drank wine and got back in the rental car, went back to wherever it was. We turned in everything and flew back to Hunter. But <laughs> it, was, it was a great, great trip. And, but still, all these guys, I couldn't recognize half the guys. They're just, they were just so ate up with uh, poison ivy and so swollen. Oh, my Ugh. God. I used to get it as a kid <laughs> like that. I just look at them picture of it i'd get it but i didn't get yeah. it I, I took shots as a kid maybe that helped i don't know i didn't really even see any but, okay so back to you know just cause happened and uh oh for that little incident i was awarded by a i, I don't know if he was a, he was a senior alo over at regiment and he put me in for a bronze star and again my alo says uh no you know, it's just part of our job. We don't need medals. So I'm like, uh, and so it was rejected. They rejected it, said it, but it said no. So the wing Jeez. puts me in for Air Force commendation with a B device. I'm like, <laughs> you got to be kidding. I could add uh. two more points that I had to star for promotion and yeah, yeah. i needed it my first master my first test for master i needed this so i made it on my second time for master but that was that well, anyway again i don't care it seems weird yeah that like, i mean it was definitely worthy of a bronze star i mean i think a lot of guys got that on that operation I, you know that it's, i've seen see people get them for less than that and, I, yeah, I, exactly. I'll, I'll respect. I, I just said, okay, that's the way it goes. Also, I'm doing, oh, I, in fact, I, I had to dig up a bunch of paperwork this week to kind of, you know, having a dramatic brain injury and other concussions throughout my life. I, I have memory 
I had to get jogged. And I read that that Bronze Star paperwork, and I'm like, man, five points. <laughs> I yeah. kept thinking of the points. I don't care. But, you know, I was, uh, and that's a good point. Like guys like us, it's not like we need to wear it on our chest. We're like, man, I need that for promotion. You know, I want to get my next rank. Is that's that's the only that's the only real reason we wanted it. And we don't want the recognition. We just exactly. you know, it helps out. Yeah. All our jump wings, you know, master blasters, Halo, Halo jump master, aerosol stuff. Those are army promotion points. Right. <laughs> the Air Force could give a you know don't care at all. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, back to back in the Rangers, I got deployed with uh, regimental recon uh, in Germany. Uh, cool. Working, uh, we had missions uh, along the eastern side of Germany, doing reporting back on stuff. And uh, we're talking eighty six. Wait, is it eighty six? Re- I, I, I went to also a reforger, which confuses me, but. Anyway, oh, the range out at Fort Stewart where we about got killed. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, the F-18. You know, that, that was, man, I uh, think of that, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, this guy comes off carrier working uh, at uh, 14s and the uh, F-18s, I mean, and, and uh, doing cluster bombs at the range at Fort Stewart. And the OP's on top. And it's a river down below, and out there's the range. Um, he's cleared. I don't know who 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 brought him from the IP, but to run in, but he wasn't cleared. He was not right. cleared. But they go by cleared automatically by leaving the IP. Right, and right. He, we're standing there, and he's coming. Yeah, you know, balls to the wall, almost just above treetop level. I mean, he's screaming in. All of a sudden, we see that clamshell come off, open up. Oh, my God. And actually went like this and separate. And every one of us just hit the dirt. And 10 feet above (laughs) our head, all those bomblets just shot by us down into the rain. Oh, my God. clamshells up the way. And uh, it was looking gruesome there for about two milliseconds in my mind, we're dead. And, oh. And, uh, I just hit the dirt, everybody did. And, and we sent that, his name was uh, Cleaver, call sign Beaver. And uh, so he, he, uh, uh, oh man, he's like, I don't know what happened to him from the Navy standpoint, but we sent the clamshell back to them. <laughs> and for proof. The, the yeah, yeah. Clear. And so they sent it back to us full of beer. Oh, and, nice. <laughs> and it was hanging up in the FSO's office. I don't know right if it's still on. there or not, but we drank all the beer, took it out. That's, and, a, that's uh, a classy move. That's a pretty yeah, good move. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I'm sure he caught a lot. Uh, you oh, know, God. CEO from that. I mean, that could have been. Oh, another, another meter or two. You guys have been dead. Yeah. And, and even if some of them landed in front of us, I mean, they didn't have to hit us, but that was coming over our heads. You could hear them arm and shh, yeah, this little with wind noise. Oh, yeah. And yeah, yeah. I made my mouth dry thinking of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you got guys on there that that shit was every day almost for, you know, not not cleared hot, but stuff blowing up around them. And I, and I again, so much respect and I appreciate you having me on. I, I, I'm like the not necessarily war part of your <laughs> title. Yeah, right. Not war story. I'm well, like, the thing about it, it's just it, it really all about is right place, right time. I mean, there's a lot of guys who, you know, were in even more so than a lot of dudes. You know, even even uh, even those of us who were in the in the fight most of that time were, you know, I, like I didn't I my war stories are few and far between whereas there was a lot of guys who were like in it all the time like every, almost every mission so yeah. it just it just boils down i mean it's not like yeah. it's it's nothing to do other than you know like tommy case always says wrong place wrong time or wrong place right time but um yeah there's no hero. it's just yeah for sure for sure uh yeah it just it you just never know you know it's it's not from a lack of trying for sure on your part i mean you you were in you 
were yeah, neck deep looking, in a bunch of dead cool looking, stuff. And I was pretty ate up after. But anyway, my uh, jump back. I, I left the Ranger Battalion on a humanitarian reassignment, and uh, my wife had her cancer had developed cancer. And back up right before Gulf, the first Gulf War, I was ready. Uh, to get out. We owned the restaurant and bar down on River Street called Corky's. We had uh, 21 rental units I was running and, and plus being in the battalion. I was going to get out and go in the Air Guard locally. And uh, I was up at Shaw out processing. I had a final check in my hand, or they had it for me there. And everybody was down on the flight line out processing the fighters and people deploying, all the age guys and mechan mechanics and whatnot. I couldn't find I, I was like, okay. I called up Don. I go, I'm not getting out. <laughs> and at this time, we didn't know about her cancer either. Yeah. And I'm not I'm, I'm, I'm staying in. Okay, whatever. Okay. And so now I need to swear back in. And I grabbed this butter bar she just she's like didn't have, even have a clue what to do <laughs> gave her the got we i don't know where we got it she read it swore i swore back in told him to keep the check i don't you know <laughs> put the finance guy put that back in my account whatever yeah, right. uh i'm going back to hunter and uh then we sat and waited and waited i went on a scuba trip with donna we went down to saint uh saint john's uh, St. Thomas would, and dove, and she was like getting really winded, couldn't hardly do anything. She could barely drag herself back into the hotel. Got her checked out, and we got back, and she had uh, breast cancer, and oh, it was God. already metastasizing, so it got aggressive, and, and uh, man, talk about tough. Talk about a warrior. Wow. Their spirit never... Uh, and we had great support. Uh, God, you know, Marty and Roger, my bosses, uh, the ALOs, everybody was understanding. The Army, Army was too. And uh, couldn't do anything more after four months for her. And uh, we took the humanitarian, and I went to Randolph Air Force Base as in CE, making sidewalk and curbing after being in the Ranger Battalion. <laughs> Wow. With sledgehammers and shovels and, and uh, oh man, what a what a what a gig! And that lasted about five months. And of course, my master sergeant didn't like my uniform with ranger, you know, combat patch and jump wings. All that you can't wear that. Yeah, I can. I'm yeah. not in your AFSC. And and uh, he, I, I ended up. He, I want to drive some of the equipment out there. I feel a little rusty. And, I was driving all this heavy equipment that I knew I was trained on at the Ranger Battalion for, you know, if there's stuff on the airfield that need to be moved, I got, I went to some of those classes early on. Right. Right. So I am moving sand piles around, just kicking up dirt and dust, having fun. But chief, I think his name is chief Jones. He was Tommy Jones, not the underwear guy, but Tom, I think that was <laughs> I probably screwed that up. I don't remember. But he, he and uh, Master Sergeant Dennis Weiss from the schoolhouse had uh, put together an idea of needing a recruiter because our retention rate was so bad over at Lackland, a recruiter to help on that retention. And uh, I, I got a message to call him, and they have a bulletin board because during the day at sea, you're always out. And the guy, nobody liked this. Yeah, NCYC, <laughs> and he writes in this huge letters. Uh, Tech Sergeant McKay, call Chief uh, Senior. I, I think he's Senior Enlisted Advisor. Maybe he was a Command Chief. Call, he wrote all that in the name and the phone number. And my the boss comes in. We all come in at four or four thirty, and he, what is this? Whoa, wait, who's this Chief? Where's he calling you for? What? I don't know. I don't know him. And I had met him though at Shaw hey. at, at, at the wing at, from the Rangers, but uh, uh, he was at a jump fest. But so, <laughs> God, I could just see the steam coming out of it. I was about <laughs> to explode. He's so red, and uh, I just played it cool and said, "Oh, 
called him and, and he said, Hey, I'm going to Fort Hood. I just speak to the guys up there. I just want you to run, get you to ride up with me. And I said, Sure, I'll tell the NCIC I'm kind of going to be here that day. Well, I'll pick you up there. And uh, so I, uh, I went up there and we discussed what needed to be done. And I came back. I was still having to work CE there for a little bit. That's <laughs> one of the stories that I was. Every, we rotate on Saturday doing street sweeper. You do the flight line, then you do the general circle or yeah, vice yeah. versa. I went and, of course, <laughs> I'm not a great street street sweeper driver. Uh, right. I, I'm going through and the generals and there's a alcove. I'm shooting through that. But all of a sudden I hear this, bam, bam. And I look back and I just took out his flags across the top of his house. <laughs> it's like 6.30 in the morning and I just kept driving. I, I did not want to get any, I didn't want to wake him. If it, if that didn't, I, I don't, right, right, never right. heard a thing about it. Never heard anything. Really? No, nobody came. Somebody <laughs> rang my flags. I don't know what happened. Anyway, that was a, <laughs> what a, uh, that's the only That's incident awesome. that happened. You can't damage much with a, a sledgehammer and a shovel, but with a street sweeper, boy, you can do some damage. <laughs> Those things are huge. Uh, now, anyway, back to Hunter. I mean, uh, uh, pardon me, back to uh, Randolph. Going to Lackland to be the recruiter. Worked out. I was doing briefings with uh, all the students, all the Everybody in the auditorium, I don't know, six, seven, I don't know how many people in there, but a few hundred, 500, 400, whatever. And I'd give them my spiel, and we had a, a small movie. And uh, anyway, I sold them. I told them they'd meet me over in that corner afterwards if you're interested. And I give them slips to give the appointment slips to come meet me and take a PT test, talk to me, meet me, talk to them, and take a PT test. And, Little did I know, some of those guys turned out to be some damn great. You know, I have nothing to do with it. All I did was give them an appointment slip and a PT test. They did the rest of themselves. <laughs> Man, some guys that are big names in the career field. and, and uh, But it's a testament that those two would reach out to you without even like, – you didn't, you didn't initiate any of this stuff. You were just oh, doing no. this for your wife and – and they, you know, people thought highly enough of you to say, look, he doesn't need to be working CE. He is obviously a, a good role model for others, a good, uh, you know, um, I don't want to say, you know, you're a good example to put in front of new recruits to sell the Tech B career field for sure. And I, I think that's, a, like I said, that's a testament to you and how, how well respected you were in the career field and, and how well you are respected in the career field, well, frankly. Thank you. I was very fortunate that they picked me because, I don't know how much of that I could see I was going to take. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the guys that I, I know, the names that stick out right off is, you know, Shrappy, Mike Shropshire and, and sure. Matt Nugent. Uh, For sure. Guys yep, yep. That, and he told me a story that I don't need, I didn't remember that I had, uh, I guess it was a down day. Nugent was, uh, him and another guy in their room and, and they're waiting for orders. They're waiting to go to Herbert. And I think this is a holiday, I think. I don't know. But anyway, I'm there for some reason. And uh, I live 30 miles away up on the Guadalupe River up north of uh, New Braunfels. Even. I kick on their door. Hey, wake up. You know, I said, hey, <laughs> meet me at the truck in 15 minutes. Bring your swim trunks and grubby clothes. And so they, I'm out there waiting, and they come and get in the truck, and I take them up to my house, and I had two five-gallon uh, cans of uh, Thompson water seal, and the deck of my house was all the length <laughs> of the house on the back, and the railings and the floors, and, and <laughs> I told them what I needed to be done. Probably, I'd have been in jail for doing this. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And, and and in fact, Matt goes. He, I was at I was at the last graduating class at the schoolhouse. It just so happened uh -huh. I was close and uh, went to the last graduation. And uh, this is when he told me that. And uh, and uh, he goes, 
So they're out there working. I said, I'm going to go get some barbecue and some and beer. I'll be back. And if you're good, you have a, you can have a beer. Well, <laughs> they didn't, they were just like dumbfounded, just speechless. They don't know what, what the hell they're getting into. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and then the guy tells Matt, he goes, after I left, can he legally do this to us? <laughs> and Matt goes, just shut up and, and start painting. painting. And uh, I came back an hour, I don't know, sometime later, and, and yeah, they're still working. And I, I had the barbecue, and I brought enough beer. <laughs> Probably too much beer for them. But uh, and they knocked it out pretty damn quick. I, and and uh, nice. I said, okay, down there is the river, and there's a lot of girls, and there's a lot of people floating tubes. And I'm right above the tube chute, and people go through the chute. And then they get out and go up and do it again, or they be oh, at the yeah, beach yeah. and with their coolers. And they met some girls. They had a good day. I, I just uh, put it that way. They had a great day, and uh, nice. took them back to base that night. And, <laughs> God dang! I, I was like, did I really do that? God, I can't yeah. believe I would do that. <laughs> right? Oh uh, shoot! But oh, anyway, man. that 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 was, uh, you know, one thing I want to say about the PJs there, and I I, I don't. I remember Maltz and, and Spike and some of these guys. Uh, I I don't remember the guy that helped me. Donna was in uh, critical condition. Her, her lungs were filling up and mitral valve had eaten up and her, she was actually drowning in her fluid in fluids. They were draining her with needle through the back and and uh, constantly and, and she used to have congestive heart failure is what that is. And, and and I believe it's from too much of this tamoxifen that they that was an experimental that they tried on her. Mm. Forget about this freaking experimental. Shit. That's later in the story. But anyway, they, they, she uh, was on the fourth floor at Wilford Hall or fifth floor. It's like before you don't leave alive. And uh, we just bought this new house over on the river, and. We'd lived up and around the corner, up the hill. Well, I, these guys were all there, and you know, told me they're sorry. And I said, "Man, I, I got to move this stuff out of my house, and I'm not sure I get, if anybody knows a moving company that can, like, today get the stuff out." And she wants to go to the house. She doesn't want to be in the hospital. <sighs> these guys, I God, I wish I knew his name. He, he's PJ. Bald-headed guy, not real big, but just the nicest man, quiet. He uh, shows up with a class. He asked for volunteers, and, and a bunch of guys went after They said, yeah, we'll go. He brought an Air Force truck. <laughs> he commandeered nice. a small <laughs> semi, about a 40-foot trailer, and oh, they really? moved that house. And my house that I was renting up the hill was a switch back driveway and it's gravel you go in and you got to take a left and then you got to take a hard right and it's straight up to the garage and wow. uh, man running a motorcycle back to my garage all the time was a it was a challenge but uh they emptied that house and they would take the truck down they had guys unloading a bunch of wives neighbors of ours were setting up the house I'm with her at the at the hospital. They're saying she won't make the ambulance ride, and she's. I said you don't know her. She is tough, and she says yeah. she's going to do something. She's going to do it, and uh, so the house gets partially set up. Kids' rooms, beds were up, and, and their dresses, and our bed was up, and some stuff in the living room. But everything else was piled in the garage. But these guys were running back. They would unload. Part of them would unload and run back up and start positioning furniture down where the semi, where they could load it on the semi. Unbelievable at what they did for us and, and never could thank them enough. I, I wish I could remember names, but uh, anyway, that uh, they took care of that. She passed and, and I figured, you know, I'm now my humanitarian's over there going to can me out of here somewhere kids are in high school and I talked to my commander gave me another year for Sean to graduate and Shane went on to uh, live with uh, my family because I got sent 
uh, let's see, I was a recruiter for a little over two years, I think, three, maybe close to three. Um, so anyway, I got assignment to Vicenza. I don't remember if I made the connection for that or what happened, but my commander goes, I can't give you any more. Yeah. And so go to Vicenza solo and working there. We're training guys that were coming out of Bosnia. They drive up to the range east of Aviano and they were cooks, mechanic, whatever, whoever spoke English were training them how to call air and, and using their local maps back in Bosnia. This is going to be your range of fire. You, this is where you, your OP and your range of fire, you don't call air anywhere else, but this, you know, and, right. <laughs> and uh, had some working with some great guys there. Uh, God dang, Calvin, it's a sweat guy, Steve Swales, Calvin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jay Limley, oh, kind of wealth of information. Clay was still there. Clay Christian, who is a very wealth of information, was yeah, the NCOIC. Yeah. And I was taking his position. These guys were just great. You know, we did deployments up the Hohenfels and Graf and Beer. We did air out on the, on the ranges east of Aviano. Got to fly with General Welsh was before he was the general. He was uh, over there at Aviano, and I, his DO. I flew back seat on a sixteen trainer with him, and Welsh was nice. in another one. And we went out air to air with some Marines over the Baltic. Oh, really? Over over <laughs> the uh, Baltic Sea there, and wearing poopy suits and you know G suits, of course. And God, what a blast that was! And uh, you know, they said, if, it, if you go down this water, it's going to be freaking gold. These suits aren't that good, and they leak probably. So I'm like, oh, that's really refreshing. You know? Yeah, that's <laughs> nice if I make it to the water. <laughs> so, oh, right, right. Uh, did all the egress training. And off we went. And, yeah, the, and the hot wash. You know, of course, the general one. Yeah, the way that is. The Marines. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. It, was, it was tight because they, they were, oh, oh, you know, they're balking at everything. You say, oh, I had you here, you know, playing the wristwatch <laughs> yeah, yeah. air show. And, but, <laughs> yeah, it was a good time. Uh, a lot of good stuff happened there. I had my bike there. That was one good thing. I was all over Europe on my time off on a motorcycle. Oh, that would have been awesome. Oh, man, yeah. I covered every place, every country. We, we would go on the weekend, myself and this, uh, this Army guy that I hung around, but we would go over – through Slovenia down into Croatia for the weekend. And right down the road, a war is going on, but it, yeah. we'd hit 10 different bars in a night and uh, with this uh, Croatian <laughs> dude we'd late, always link up with. And you'd think it was summer vacation, all the Germans, all kinds of people, the bars are packed, partying left and right. Nobody knows what's going on down the road. Right, right. And speaking of down the road, we, we, you know, we had practiced in August of, I want to say 95, we were first boots on the ground in Tuzla in December. But that August, we practiced for seven or nine, ten days. I don't know how many days it was. Uh, but we were we were it, to go in and save six and 60-year-old men from Grozny and um, Zebranica. And we practiced that shit. I mean, during the day, during the night, hugging these mountains because it's identical terrain to there in bosnia right right and ready to go do the real thing they're all to meet in the in the soccer fields where we're going to be picking them up out of chinooks like multiple multiple lifts and damn it, the president has called it off and uh see him 20 years later going to put a wreath at the mass grave sites yeah that was disheartening as hell when when we got there and we knew they'd already been mass graves we had to protect from news and uh, CNN people were like f***ing vultures. Yeah. They're following us everywhere. We had to give them a slip or, you know, we'd take multiple vehicles and everybody branch off. And so they didn't know where, <laughs> which one was going to where or where it even was. And uh, that was a shame. Met up and you were saying, had you guys gone in, 
you probably could have saved their lives. Oh, exactly. Instead of, exactly. Instead of pr protecting mass graves, you could have just protected the people. It was, almost, of, yeah. it was close to 10,000 total. I mean, it was yes. at two different cities, six to 60, all males. And, and I, I, unbelievable that it got called off. And the mass yeah, graves show there's, you know, thousands in some of these graves alone. And yeah. And they, they're all scurried around the country. They they buried them in different places, but it, it was atrocity, yes, for sure. And for uh, sure. we were to meet with uh, Captain Malone. Was my alo? Him and I went to a, a meeting where he's going to be Serb and Bosnian generals meeting, and we were to provide any air cover of anything that might go off. And we got there, and there were Serbs that were there. There's a bombed out hotel. There was nothing, but in the back they had a bakery, and that's where these guys were. I think it was five of them, maybe, maybe six. But uh, it was all warm back there, and they looked healthy as hell. These Serbs, they were strong. They spent, they've spent their whole high school years. All they've been in this building for four years with weapons pointed across the field or anybody coming against going to, into Serbia from Bosnia. And yeah. they, all they did is watch movies and, and they spoke better in so much English. That it was just shocking. That, <laughs> and they learned it from watching movies and they asked where uh, we're from. And I said, Texas. And they go, Oh, John Wayne cowboys. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> now, I think I would it. God, somebody I, I don't major Cat Malone. I, I know somebody said Chicago. I think we had an maybe an army guy with us or something. But oh, Michael Jordan, blah blah blah. Oh, got, oh man, <laughs> could care less. He knew all John the pop Wayne, culture man. stuff. <laughs> but but they, their English was awesome. Just the movies, man. And the, all the years have been crammed into this place. I mean, this it's no it wasn't very big at all, and. Uh, Wow. But that was uh, went off without a hitch there. Everybody met and whatever happened, happened. And we were back heading back to Tuzla. We're doing these patrols during, you know, the time I'm there, I'm sending every day if somebody would go up to the Saba River where they're building the bridge, the floating bridge on both sides to meet. And all the heavy stuff coming down from Hungary would come in because we had no equipment. All the roads were blown up. This big bridge right. at the Sabo is my turn to go up. The day, it just happened to be the day that they put it together. And uh, <laughs> you witnessed that and all the APCs and, and tanks and everything, flying American flags coming across. And CNN, of course, is there. I had made yeah. friends with this girl from CNN because she wanted really wanted to see the mass graves and that kind of you know, he never told her where they where it was or anything, but I ah, see what I can do. You know, I kept saying, that. "All right." And so it's time for that, and they're broadcasting live. And I said, "Hey, let me use your sat phone." And I called this girl to my girlfriend back in uh, at te in Texas uh, in Austin, and I said, "Hey, turn on TV on CNN right now and see me." <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I didn't get in front of the camera and do something. Sure, sure. I said, yeah. There's cameras all around. I'm sure I'm standing here next to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And there's, ah, oh, I see you. I see you. And I'm talking. Over, and <laughs> it's That's crazy. Stuff we do. <laughs> I tell you. Yeah, anyway, man. But uh, so it, it wasn't, but it, maybe a, a week after that, about six weeks into this, and I get a, there's a call back to my, the headquarters at Tuzla, and I got to make call back that my flight physical that I took in December, my birth month. Um, yeah, this is weird. I always, right on my birthday, I jumped into Panama on the 21st, I mean 20th, but the 21st was my birthday. Then the 21st, we jumped in. I mean, uh, we were supposed to jump in at Bos in Bosnia, Tuzla, but it was too, so cold, it was so frozen, not, no planes could even see. We landed, it was oh. a sheet of ice. Everybody's falling on their ass. You couldn't they didn't have any defrost. It, planes had to keep warm and keep moving around, and, and yeah, it, was, yeah. it was pretty bad. 
you know, worst winter in 40 years, that kind of stuff. But uh, wow, everybody has that saying compared to World <laughs> right, War II, right. I think is what they – anyway, so – I got a call that says, uh, hey, you tested positive for hepatitis C, and you have a, a, we started with your blood work, and your ALT, AST were through the roof, so we tested your blood, and you have hep C. I'm like letting that sink in. I go, uh, you got the wrong guy, I think. I'm f- perfectly healthy, and I'm, you know, aren't you supposed to be yellow or something with that? <laughs> you go, All right. Well, your eyes should be jaundice. I go, I took to somebody go, my eyes yellow. I'm still on the phone with these people. I go, no, you got the wrong guy. There's no way. My, I don't have that. Yeah, yeah, you do. According to Air Force Reg, blah, 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 blah. You can't be in a deployed position in case you have to give blood. And I'm like, what? Who am I going to give blood to? When does that? I mean, yeah. how? I, I know it happens, but not. Yeah, but why would it be you? Yeah, like, there's yeah. tons of other people that can do it. Yeah, yeah. right. And uh, so, no, you can't be. Uh, and that turns. And I. Uh, I had to go on TDRL. I left the unit uh, at 16 and a half years. I'm a master sergeant. They give me a goodbye MSN and send me on my way. And I go to work uh, treatment at Brook Army Medical Center. 18 months of interferon injections. I self do into my subcutaneous grab roll on your stomach and stick it in. But man, yeah, the flu every. Uh, just to get over it and then you got to do another injection yeah three times a week or so that didn't work and then they have an experimental drug so they want me to try that okay that and then i was also depressed as hell that one it wasn't working two i'm looking at you know the air force and the career field are getting farther away from me and i'm getting so depressed so they put me on a bunch of pills and and this experimental drug plus so just scrambling me up bad and it got to a point i took a duffel bag of weapons from my house pistols rifles shotguns i went to a hotel to blow my brains out literally gonna do this and i was really really tired because I quit taking what they gave me that day. I said, That's, I don't need to take it. I'm not going to be around and need it. And I was really tired. And I went, I, I went and laid on the bed, I had a hotel room with two beds. And I woke up whenever I woke up. And I looked, and I saw all my weapons laid out on this other bed, pistols, rifles, shotguns. I, Jesus, I can't do that. I got a wife, I remarried, kids, stepkids, to, you know. That's like coming around in my senses and go, I got to get off this shit. I, it's, it's killing me or I'm going to kill me. Yeah. So I go back home and we go to, Linda, Linda and I go to the Brook Army and they, well, we can't put you in psychiatric because we don't have any room. We're full. And so you go to this clinic and it's like just a hotel almost. It was, they didn't do much. I was there a day and a half and checked myself out and went home. Uh, she came and got me. And, and, and uh, but I was, had I not got, I don't know why I felt so tired and not taking that medicine and whatever came over me and uh, that's the thought oh. of that now nothing could be that bad i, I yeah. know people fight with their demons and all and i don't know what demons i had at the t- time but just my brain was so scrambled from this medication and uh, being depressed about not being able to be back in the career field, which at another 18 months had to pass before they gave me a permanently dis- discharge, uh, full benefit, 16 and a half years for pay purpose and 30% disability. And I got out and uh, no goodbyes, no nothing. I got some certificate or something. And then about a couple months later, Doug Tillman and 
Bodie and you know, a number of guys. They're at a, a conference in San Antonio. Turns out, you know, we they want to play golf, and we get Brad, my buddy there, local, and some other folks play golf. And turns out, go back to my house, and there's a surprise retirement party. <laughs> so, oh, nice! Man, that right PJ's on. there, the head of the, the of uh, OLA there, the, of the uh, PJ CCT school. Did a presentation a gift for me, and then the TACP community gave me a, a brand new Colt 1911, and uh, nice. I was, yeah, I was, yeah, it was amazing. Oh, that had to feel good. It did. It made it all close and made it right, and felt good about it. You know, and still now it's 1999. Nothing's happened yet, and I get yeah. Doug Tillman. So they, you know, suggested I apply at Raytheon. I went out and got the job, and then they moved the corporate move, moved this beautiful home from <laughs> the hill country out to to uh, Tucson, and I worked at Raytheon Missile Systems for about three years. And they have a every January or February they have a reduction in force thing going, and so every every year i go am i on it and then his he contact the guy and we'd be at a bar on friday waiting to hear the list no you're not on it no you're not on it no you're not on it so the third time no yeah okay monday morning i am coming in and i get a call from the software director going uh can you come to my office and i'm like he's never oh, asked man. me to come to his office <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I walk, I was thinking I was going to the principal's office. That was a long walk <laughs> down the hall. Go to, oh, he says, hey, after we cut everybody that we thought we didn't have, we still need to trim the budget. So you're here with the most pay and the least tenure. And the kid that we hired three months ago is the least of the least. So we cut, both of you were going to have to let go. And I'm like, he goes, but hands me immediately a paper that says, Hey, I've already got you a job. They want you right now, Torrance, California with this company. And it's not Raytheon, but he said, I gave him a high recommendation, told him what you've done for us and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, if I did such a good job, why don't you keep me? <laughs> goes, right. It exactly. Work that yeah. way. It's got to be financial <laughs> reason. So Jeez. I'm like, Torrance, I don't even like Tucson traffic. I don't, definitely yeah, don't want to go exactly. in the back of the LA airport every day. <laughs> to right. To work. Oh, anyway, I, I said, oh, let's go to Mexico, see what happens. We've made a list of 20 cities, and Andrea's college money was put away, and, and she was in school and, and had a place. And so we traveled around, and number 12 was Mazatlan, and we fell in love with it. Bought there, and rehab some houses there, flip them. And our house was in a home tour for charity a couple of years in a row. And this guy bangs on our door, the last one. And after a couple of days, bangs on the door and said, hey, I want to buy your house. And we came up with a real exorbitant price tag. And he said yes real fast. And like, wow, who is this guy? He had no idea what we just priced this at. And we knew what yeah. everything in the historical district was going for. We bought and sold. And we had a place up on the hill, so we moved stuff into storage and went up there and then looked for a house and ended up in Alamos. Um, we moved completely from Mazatlan halfway up toward the U.S. border at Nogales is where we crossed. But uh, Alamos is in the mountains. It's a 400-year-old little town, about 10, 000, close to 10,000 now was six wow. when we moved here but that includes all the ranches and ranchitos and the, and the mountains around us little towns and uh my my the hacienda was it, right now is 249 years old it's two years wow. older than the united states Jeez, how is it down there i mean i'm I meant to ask you like is it uh I mean, obviously there's some differences, but I mean, how, yeah, how do you, how is it down there as far as like just living the whole time? I, I've enjoyed it. I, the prices are unbeatable. The people are phenomenal. Yeah. Um, when I lost my leg in that accident, uh, dude hitting me, I, 
came back months, oh, uh, got six, seven, six months later, whatever it was. And then, uh, people I didn't even know were coming up and hugging me, old ladies, and you know, gracias a Dios, <laughs> and you know, the little town. I mean, word chat, you, you know, they know everything in this little town, so sure, <laughs> sure, crazy. And you're you not exactly a like you know, a, lo- a local, so yeah. Yeah, you, know, you they you probably stick out and they're oh, like yeah. they know you I and stick out, yeah. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> stick out more now. Uh, right, right. I wear shorts yeah. a lot of the time because I gotta add and subtract these they call socks, but they fill and 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 make it so because depending on the food you eat and water levels in your body, this thing shrinks and expands and so Oh, okay. It's a little hard to drop a pair of dre- jeans in the middle of the street or in a grocery store to put a sock on and put your leg back oh, yeah. on. So yeah, you have to <laughs> lower your pants all the way. But with shorts, I don't have to just raise the pant leg and put swap it out. And nice. I ride my motorcycle in shorts all through the winter even. And, well, winter in Tucson anyway. Not up north. Right, right. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been... Guys are worse off than me. I go to the VA and thank God every time it humbles me to see this, the shape of the people that it's, uh, I'm very blessed yeah. to be having this much of me still around. For sure. Uh, but I, you know, I enjoy my Air Force career and I love the career field. The, the, the people are phenomenal. I miss it. Definitely. When I was in when we were living in Mazatlan and 9-11 happened, I was following it every chance I could get. I'm on, I got maps of every place. I'm looking and seeing online who's going where, what, what kind of, what kind of information I could find. I started getting depressed again. I, I had this, I don't, I don't want to say survival, survivor guilt. I just felt, God, I got screwed out of being, you know, with the helping little teams and being there and, Anyway, I, I don't want to take any more of your time. I've talked your ear off. I, I, I genuinely thank you for letting me come on here in the midst of all these hard charging warriors you have on. And, and oh. God bless you and uh, all these guys that I'm watching their videos and listening. I, I just I just rode up from Cabo, rode down the Baja on the bike and came back up and I'm listening. To, to your podcast on my headsets in my helmet. Uh, <laughs> I mean, right on. <laughs> you got some amazing guys. Uh, amazing, amazing, amazing guys. Yeah, it's it it truly is an honor for me to be able to uh, to hear these stories. I mean, it's just it's so. Am- and I I'm a geek about that stuff anyway. I love to hear them. So I uh, I eat it up. I just I, I just enjoy every minute of. It. And you say thank you. It, it the honor was all mine to have you on. I, like I said, from from the beginning of my career, I've known about JMAC. So, you know, this was this is a really cool thing for me, and it it really it was really an honor to to hear you talk about all this cool stuff you've done. I mean, it's it just it was a real honor, and I appreciate it. I can't thank you enough. Well, thank you again, and I salute all the guys that you've had on or will have on. We got some right serious on. warriors in this career field. For sure. Adios, amigo. All right, J Mac, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as as sometimes I do, uh, I end these things a little bit too early, and I forget to talk about some things. And I, there were some things I wanted to bring up, and that uh, you're involved with. Um, the first being the uh, the Patriot Guard. That was uh, this, and I'm not real familiar with it, but I know it's. Uh, um, it's a good effort that you guys do. So maybe talk about a little bit about that, and then we'll get into uh, a couple other things after after the Patriot Guard. Okay, the Patriot Guard started um, back when the protesters were uh, going to cemeteries for veterans' uh, burials that had been brought home and been buried, and the families that are grieving, and protesters, anti-war dis- uh, demonstrators were disrupting it. Patriot Guard started forming protective lines to keep these people away from the families and the cars and the burial site. And it is not so prevalent anymore in that respect, but we go we ride and escort the casket to the burial site. A lot of them out to the uh, in Marana, Arizona, North Tucson, uh, to the Veterans uh, Memorial Cemetery. Or they're either interned or buried. The, the, the motto is, you know, standing for those who stood for us is the motto right. of the Patriot Guard riders. 
And it's a, it, you don't have to be a American Legion rider, but a lot of the guys are. I'm, I'm not a member of the American Legion riders, uh, that club. I am part of the Patriot Guard, which is uh, made up of both American Legion and just people like me that want to donate their time and support it, the cause. Uh, yeah. we, we provide flag lines and during the ceremony, escort the casket to the cemetery. Um, the families all are real pleased to see, you know, 10, 15, sometimes 20 people standing with flags surrounding the uh, ceremony. Uh, they said walk in and then up on the uh, podium, surrounding the podium uh, where the uh, burial takes place. It's, it's rewarding. Um, you know, I only can do it when I'm up here. You know, I've got a special vest for that. And uh, instead of my rag of a jean cutoff that I normally wear <laughs> yeah. uh, for many years of patches on that, I just figured since 72, I've been riding almost consistently, having a bike, two bikes, three bikes, or building a bike. And it's, All right, it's right. a lot of, right after high school. But anyway, the Patriot Guard is really good. If you got a bike, and it doesn't matter what kind of bike, it's pretty much all, a majority are Harleys, but there's others, and there's a Can Ams even uh, people ride. So it's not restricted to what you ride. If anybody out there has got a bike, get involved. It's, it's great uh, camaraderie with these guys. And who knows, you may even end up joining the American Legion riders also. Um, are you um, are you affiliated with any, are there, is it just in Tucson or is it, no, I mean, in Arizona it's, there? Uh, it's, there's chapters everywhere, all, every state. Okay. And uh, there's a calendar posted. So, you know, I'll look at the calendar knowing that I'm going to be in Tucson and link up on it. Um, okay. It gives a short dossier of who the person is. I mean, there's, we've done Medal of Honor guys. We've got uh, older men. They just did, just missed. I, I wasn't here. They held these uh, urns of 29 homeless, uh, no no family, did a ceremony and turning them. I wish I was here for that. But yeah, yeah this it's nationwide. It's okay. affiliated pretty much with the American Legion, but you can just go to PatriotGuardRiders.com or .org. Forget what it is, but you can uh, look it up. Yeah, if somebody can Google it. For, I'm yeah, sure. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think that's a great effort because uh, I, I never understood that. Like the guy served his country. He, you know, he didn't. He has nothing to do with the policies of the of the country. Yet people show up and try to disparage his service to the to their very freedom to do that it never made any sense to me to, to 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 try to disrupt a funeral you know like that's like the poorest taste i've ever i can ever imagine you know and you know the the, the motto of uh, standing for those who stood for us it says it all i mean these, these sure. people, they're being protected by this man or this woman who were interning and uh yeah that makes sense but yeah. You know. Have you ever had any um anybody show up at one of these that or is it kind of I have I not. Like to, I, I yeah. really haven't. I, I I thought that was going to be uh when I first started about 9 years ago. But no. Not here in Tucson. Good, good. That's probably a pretty good deterrent, you know, a bunch of a, a bunch of rough riding looking guys that are, you know, yeah. standing guard. I mean, you probably nobody you know, most of the people that do that kind of stuff are cowards anyway. They're not looking for a fight. They're just looking to to voice their they're be loud opinions. and disruptive and yeah, yeah yeah well man that's commendable that's really cool i yeah like like you were saying i mean if anybody wants to get involved just either look it up on the internet i mean it's pretty easy to find i'm sure and uh yeah get involved i mean that's it's such a great great um effort yeah that's um, one reason i didn't join the rider american legion riders is I, I, i'm i can't tell when i'm gonna be here very much in, right like, like make a week before and joining any club and being responsible to the club i wouldn't be able to do that so right right I mean, uh, so just stop to be friends and hang out and do the job when they need it no i think they're i mean i'm sure they don't they are happy to have you whenever you can get up there i'm sure yeah the more the more the better i'm sure yeah they supply flags they supply water and and uh there's been some hot hot days out there too bet, and you're yeah. standing at it yeah you 
bending your knees every now and then just to get a little, <laughs> but you're at attention. I'm a long time holding that flag. Yeah. yeah you don't want to be passing it. out at a funeral. It's definitely worth it. Oh, well, that's awesome. We want to talk about. Yeah. So let's shift gears. Um, you also are involved in a thing called project healing waters. Um, yes. and I wasn't really familiar with that, but yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Yeah. This is a, it's a great opportunity for veterans. Uh, you have to have a VA rated disability. Um, yeah, it, that, there's no minimum maximum percentage required, but what it does is, uh, helps out. It one puts you with a bunch of veterans and, and, uh, I've, I've, we've got Vietnam vet guys. We've got, you know, right up to just getting out guys. And, uh, what we do is meet, weekly um it's an organization let me back up it's a 501c organization it has some government oversight uh through the va it's uh all chapters i think there's like 200 chapters in the united states again google that find the nearest one maybe in your town if somebody's interested but it's it's all about fly fishing and how the to be out there and throwing a line and wading in and just being out in nature. It, it's a real calming and soothing effect. And we tie flies on Wednesdays. They supply the materials. Um, I've grown to have my own and my own desk at home where I tie. You build fly rods. Trips are, are depending on your chapter. And we've, we've got a really good chapter and the Trout Unlimited organization in Tucson, kind of, well, they donate time and money to us. Uh, the instructions and the guy in, in our uh, chap, I guess chaperones or leaders, better word. Um, they're all very knowledgeable in fly fishing and okay. teach teach you how to cast. Teach you, but the main thing is just the camaraderie with the vets and being out in nature. I mean, it's a yes. Yeah. I love fishing. I was a diehard bass fisherman and I was introduced to it when I was in the rehab hospital and, uh, the, the uh, occupational therapist is a fly fisherman. We we're talking about fishing and I said, ah, bass fisherman. I've been, you know, amateur tournaments. I love to, you know, throw a lure under a dock or in a weed bed and, you know, bass, bass, <laughs> it's like spinning rods and whatever, but uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, he uh, got me kind of re-enthused. I had worked uh, when I was at Lackland, living up in New Braunfels around the Guadalupe River, our house was. And I'd get up in the morning and I bought a $30, I think, fly rod kit from Walmart and used to go down there and swing a fly out and where we were at, it was all brown trout because the water was warmer down from up at the dam where all the rainbows were. But it's fun. I catch fish with it, and I still have that old thing. <laughs> it's uh, 30, 20, uh, what the heck is that, 30 years old, I guess, now. <laughs> so um, the, uh, the Project Healing Waters is just it's therapy, like, can't believe. And yeah. these trips we go on are paid for. We do nothing. I'm flying to Alaska in June on this. This trip, we'll be going up jet boats up to near the glaciers and fishing for oh, cool. railing only. And uh, it's a blast. I can't wait to get back up there. So your trip to Alaska, is there? are there other trips around the United States or is it, is it all it's yes. Alaska every time? No, no. We, we go, uh, we just did the San Juan River back a couple of weeks, uh, last month. Oh, okay. Over in northern New Mexico. Um, you know, being in Tucson, there's not a whole lot of fly fishing uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we do have a we have a, a guardian angel, so to speak. Uh, Jim Click, he owns a number of the car dealerships. He's since retired, but he he's, lives on the Tucson Country Club. And there is a oh. lake there that sports bass, catfish, um, carp, um, and so every Monday is there's no golf. It's maintenance day. So in the mornings we go, we, we got permission every month to go there and fish and practice. And what's good about that is there's no trees around this lake. And, you know, for people starting out with a fly rod, you have no, uh, 
no, nothing to hang up your line. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> So, that makes it yeah the good place to start out I guess. yeah it's great it's you know again you're meeting up with the guys and uh i really i enjoy the time i every time i'm here and it's monday i'm making that trip i mean it's a good point you're talking about camaraderie and uh and nature and you know like a lot of guys they get out of the military and they they have been out in the field a lot of it and then they they retire or they get out and then they kind of just they don't have any outlet for that kind of stuff that they've been doing. So like I encourage people to, to reach out to these organizations and, and just, you know, get back into that, like you said, camaraderie, because that's really, that's the biggest part of the military is, is, you know, the, the guy or the guy or the gal to your left and right. So yeah, get out there. If you're struggling or if you're, you know, you're wondering what you're going to do next, you know, at least get out and, you know, you band together with some guys that have a, a common interest or a common, common background. Yes, sure. I agree totally. And you know, it's all branches in there, so you learn a lot about other other services. Well, yeah. In our career field, we pretty much exposed all the other, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> at one point or another. But, yeah, uh, yeah, it's really really good and uh, therapeutic. I like it. Cool. Uh, one more thing I want to talk about before I let you go. Um, the year you, as you said in before, you you lost your leg. Um, can you talk a little bit about? maybe some tips, some techniques or some like, uh, just, sure. um, just something about like, you know, other people that have lost a limb or maybe just have just lost a limb and they're trying to start, they're struggling with it. Or they're trying to figure out how to, how to navigate through it. And maybe some of the guys you've helped in the past. Uh, I know it's a unique thing that we don't often get to hear about. So yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Sure. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I at the rehab hospital, I was pretty motivated that I was pretty motivated from the minute they told me I lost my leg, but, uh, I, yeah. I really, in fact, I was so motivated, they tricked me saying that uh, they weren't going to release me on Friday, this one day that I was scheduled a, a month, of six, five, six weeks there, and whatever. And so she says, well, we're not going to release you on Friday. I go, no, I got an apartment that, <laughs> near the hospital for outpatient therapy, blah, 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 I'm scheduled this. And, no, no, we're going to keep you. You're too motivating to the staff and the people oh. here running through the, I mean, not running, in my wheelchair through the halls and hua hua and all this and that and talking to people in the, in the uh, I call it the gymnasium. It's a therapy room with, where you walk yeah, yeah. between bars and steps and all the jazz. People who can't do this or that, I go over and talk to them and motivate them and <laughs> probably just, irritate them really but anyway uh <laughs> no way i'm sure i'm sure you that's probably why they wanted you to stay there because you're 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 the kind of guy who just motivates people you know you're 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 very energetic and a hard charger and they it probably helped a lot of guys to get off their butts and like you know work a little harder i bet yeah i motivated some old lady that has not been out of her wheelchair in years hardly can stand and let alone we get up on her own and kept kept at her after a few days she's up and doing her thing and walking between the bars a wheelchair sitting in between but yeah it was That's that awesome. was a nice feeling but i i, I they told me no you're not leaving and, and she goes yeah you're leaving I said, okay <laughs> i said if you need me for anything call me but and well that you know that happened so i started getting nice. calls for, for depressed amputees and and you know, some of these people were veterans, some, but they all, uh, it seemed like they had a, a neuropathy from a diabetic, uh, you know, their diabetes had turned uh -huh. their foot or their ankle. Some had infections that turned into just had to amputate and amputate mm -hmm. again. And, Man. um, but I, I was called in, talked to some people and, and kind of for a while there was, pretty, I don't know, a couple, three, a, a year or four, I don't know, something like that. But, um, you know, lip, when I finally did get released from all my therapies and, and uh, prosthetics and everything, I, I went out living in Mexico, 500 miles south of Tucson. It's not easy to get, run up and help out. And when I, I do it when I'm in town, for sure. And, uh, yeah. But, you know, guys, in fact, I introduced a couple to Project Healing Waters and, and uh, I go pick them up and, you know, get them to the to 
to, to the uh, fly tying on Wednesdays. And a lot of them were just new amputees that you, you, they're not going out fishing. They're not, uh, yeah. they're, and they're depressed. And, and, and I, I get it and I don't get it because here you are, like, if you're a diabetic and you don't take care of yourself, and you start getting neuropathy in your feet and ankles, legs. I mean, I don't know if, whose fault that is, if it's too much sitting, if they're not motivated enough to even. But I'm not going to diss anybody that's like that. And Sure. I mean, I think you're doing the right thing. The best thing you can do, yeah, it's not going to do anybody any good to come down on them because they're oh, just gonna, no. you're going to push them down even farther. Yeah, yeah you bring in, you got to lift them up like you're doing. I think that's the best way to go. And if they, and if you, if they can see a guy like you, riding motorcycles, you know, uh, going to trimming huge, trees, <laughs> huge, huge block parties, you know, that, those yeah. pictures you sent me from Mexico. Yeah. I mean, if they see, if they see that, then they're like, oh yeah, my life isn't over. I can just, you know, I can still move. I can still do stuff. You know, exactly. they're not. They're adapt not and overcome. Though. Adapt. Yeah, for sure. Shoot, yeah, I may be slower than most, but I get around. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Like, it's not stopping you by any means. Uh, I mean, you. I think the most uh, irritating yeah. thing about having this uh, prosthetic leg is that I can't feel what's underneath it. So I'm. Oh, I yeah. always walk with my head up and my eyes forward, and I get good balance, and still got good balance, but I. Yeah. Now I'm looking down, looking for cracks or uneven. And, you know, gosh, my town is 400 years old. My house is 240, right. 249 right now, my hacienda. And so it's, oh, everything's uneven. <laughs> Cobblestones yeah, yeah. and this and that. But <laughs> There's no right angles anywhere, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my house is adobe. It's about 39, 40 inches thick. It's, yeah, no, nothing's square. Yeah. But it's a beautiful <laughs> old place. Um, but anyway, back to, you know, walking and, and being able to feel something. I, I'll be at dinner and somebody say, hey, you're on my foot <laughs> under the table. I don't know where it is. I can't tell if I'm stepping on. Yeah, the <laughs> so, uh, something I got to just be aware of all the time. But small yeah. price to pay to be up and around. And, uh, you know, I had oh, a running sure. blade, did some, did a did a. Uh, uh, Spartan race did the second level one, eight, yeah. uh, eight miles, 27 obstacles or something. With, uh, four how was that? Eight. I mean, how it had to be kind of different to be, yeah, it, yeah, it was, it, but it, I completed it only by because uh, Bob Raganisi, former tech D, now fireman back uh, outside Boston, um, he's he's the motivator on that. And that guy's ate nice. up with those, he's he's phenomenal big into jujitsu now. And anyway, Bobby, somebody I recruited and met later in life <laughs> after military and we pal and I go out there and visit it and watching his boys grow up. Now they're wrestling and they're doing good. Anyway, back to yeah. this, uh, people, you know, they put their own limitations on themselves. And that's what I find yeah. with these, when I meet these fellas and, it's all been guys and uh and it's all been legs it's no i don't know what uh, arms I, I wouldn't know what to tell anybody yeah about that but and they, the, the, the legs they make you can do so much um it's amazing and and, and i'm below the knee and but the, that was a bad knee and i was scheduled that monday after the, the guy drunk hit me uh, to have uh, sin disc injections because it's just bone on bone. And when she told me it was below the knee, when I came two days later, I was trying to mumble through all the tubes in my mouth and everything that oh, cut off my knee. It's no good. You know? <laughs> and, she's, and then uh, she didn't know what I was saying and she just gave me a shot and I was out again. But anyway, uh, I, but I, you were happy they didn't, right? That's what you mentioned before. Yeah. Like, that would have been a bad move. Yeah, yeah. You're using sixty yeah. percent more energy just below the knee, but you're using one hundred and ten above the knee. And my hats off to anybody who's above the knee. And one of our buddies, uh, HK down there, and the, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's above the knee, and yeah. uh, I think he started below, and then the infection grew, and they had to go a second time. I, my, man, I don't know if I. 
That's some tough stuff right there. That guy's yeah. amazing. And yeah, he posts fun. like videos or pictures and him moving around and doing stuff still. It's it's motivating for sure. Yeah. yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's still getting after it. You know, I've, I pushed it too hard to where after those races, this Spartan race and running on that blade, my stump or my knee at, I got so full of fluid I couldn't put on a, a uh, prosthetic. It was oh, really? that much, and they drained a whole lot of fluid out, and it ended up just being uh, white blood cells protecting that bone on bone. Ended up laying in bed oh, shoot, three weeks without it. It was the most, <laughs> oh, man, I hated it. He was laying oh, in man. bed with my leg elevated and looking at that big fat thing and, and <laughs> uh, kept getting it drained. Huge syringes, you know. I don't know how much they take out at a time, but anyway, I uh, made it through that, but I, I, I ended up getting a knee replacement, and that was another wild thing, because there's only an inch and a half of tibia below my knee to connect it to, so right. they designed a, you know, designed a new knee. I think I mentioned that earlier, but anyway, yeah, yeah. that... that uh, that made a big headway for me and back on track. And I just walk now. I don't even, I don't run. It's just, I don't want to, I don't want to go back to yeah. banging it up and anything or sores. You got to be careful about getting it an infection or it's sweat oh, yeah. down there. And it's, it's a breeding ground for germs. If you don't keep it clean and keep dry. And, uh, well, you got any other techniques like that or any, anything that sticks in your mind? Like, you know, that, that we wouldn't, that, that a guy who has just lost a limb wouldn't think about like driving or like you ride, like you said, you ride your motorcycle. Is there any kind of like things you got to do differently to kind of. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of ad ad adaptations I've had to do. Um, speaking of motorcycle, I have uh, on this bike, on this heritage, I've got the shifter is out five inches. I don't, it had a heel toe, but I took off the heel cause there's no way can I, can, I don't have a ar articulation on my oh, right, right. heel. So it's, I just pop it, pop it, you know, lift my whole leg to shift and then <laughs> step on it and ease it back down to downshift. But okay. yeah. And my other bike was, I had a, a custom bike I built while I was in a wheelchair and, and uh, that bike had a seven inch out shifter because it had a custom six gallon tank on it. But oh, okay. you know, you just do adapt and overcome, like I said. And, and uh, um, it's, you know, my left lower leg. So getting in on any car on the passenger side just seems like a nightmare, especially small cars. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. You're getting a ride with somebody or whatever. I'm like, God, getting in now. <laughs> and, I try not to use the handicap spots, but I got to have the door all my truck door all the way open to get in and out on, yeah. on the driver's side. So, you know, you got to kind of think where you're going to park and don't get too close to anything that you're not going to be able to get back in. I have squeezed right, right. in, but it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Cause you got to like push off with that left leg. You'd have to, uh, yeah, how that'd be tough to even get, get in there because, yeah. yeah, and and you know, going to uh, uh, back to the bike instead of getting on on the shifter side, the left side, and throwing my leg over, I got to get on on the right side and put my prosthetic leg over first. Uh -huh. And I'm continuously, after all these years of riding, I keep going to the wrong side of the bike and <laughs> go back around, and go, yeah. A muscle memory, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. It's just yeah. like, hey, I could get on the bike. Oh, well, not that way. <laughs> yeah, it's, you can't spin and pivot. I, I was yeah, worried yeah. about riding horses, how that's going to be. And, and uh, once you get the stirrup on that side balanced out, it, it was is back to normal. It's not a. Yeah. It was not a problem. Uh, is that the same way? Do you have to like mount from the right and then swing your swing your left leg over? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And uh, usually, got to have somebody holding the horse because most horses yeah. they don't. They're not used to somebody getting on on that side, and uh, right. <laughs> it wants to keep moving sideways, and thinking you want to push it sideways. And no, no, yeah. no, we're not going there. <laughs> I remember the first time I did do it, I it was on a, it was at a uh, 
amputee clinic that hanger sponsored and boy, I was, that and going to the VA hospital, you know, just for anything and seeing people, it, it humbles yeah. you so much. It's like, Oh, for man, sure. I am so, so blessed. But, uh, yeah, you're so thankful yeah. regardless of what you're going through. There's always somebody that has something worse going on. Exactly. For sure. You're right. JD. Exactly. Uh, they they had me get on a platform to get on the horse and, and so you oh, have a couple <laughs> steps and you know there's people everywhere to catch you like you know nice. it's not my first rodeo <laughs> right <laughs> so, yeah I go up a ladder I always go up with my right foot first right foot right leg and then bring yep. up the left right you know just and going down I'm just the opposite on the house I've got a permanent ladder metal ladder that's uh, affixed to the house to go up okay and it's it, it's at an angle and so are the steps on it i have custom made and and uh oh nice go check out the roof and every time i come back from being gone that's the first thing i do is go up there and survey everything there's a couple acres walled in and uh two and a half or so and it's uh you know oh, just awesome. look at everything and see what get a perspective from up there and check the roof and look at the drains and make sure all the no leaves are up there. Yeah, it's a beautiful view too. I got Mount Alamos, yeah, yeah, seventy two hundred on one side of the town, and then my backyard faces the western slope of the Sierra Madres. Oh, it's pretty cool. I think it's amazing that you live down there. Do you ever? I mean, you don't have to get into it, but do you ever? I mean, a lot of Americans have a rough time down there. Like we just like those four, those four people just got kidnapped and then two got killed. Do you ever run into anything like that, or are you kind of like? you're one of the guys now or you're they know you or how, how does that work down there for a you? little bit of both you know i only incident that i've had was a guy tried to carjack me at gunpoint um he lost his carjacking license over that he, <laughs> that, that was a crazy story and it involved my i tell it real quick i okay. i just come back town and my father-in-law had passed away so i had a good buddy he was, he was shot a lot of guns together fished and anyway race back to back to texas i'm 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 an hour and a half from home and i go okay i need some coffee i just drove down here all day and i'm which is not normal i usually do it at night but I had some things to do on the way down so I stop at a convenience store that I normally stop at and got some coffee and a couple bottles of water. And I said, God, I got to take a piss. And I look out, there's a gas station adjacent, there's diesel station in between. There's a bus over there with a whole big long line of people going to the use the restroom. So I just go, okay, I've take, I slept back here when I, to, you know, I get that far. And that's usually where I'm at, about out of gas. So I always fill up there and, take yeah. a nap if it's if i'm driving all night a couple hours so i go back there and i open the door and i just was unzipping and this guy starts walking to me and he's just too close and i'm sensing right away this something i said kd said you know i said i'll do it in english i said hey what what's up and I, yeah he's uh yanks the door and throws a pistol at me but i'm already I got my handhold on the uh, this Dodge 2500 truck and yeah. handhold up there and hand on the door. So we're having a tug of war and I'm saying, fuck you, get the fuck out of here. And he, right. he keeps pointing and going, out, out, out in English. Fuck you, motherfucker. And I know once I am, he doesn't want to blow my head off or shoot me in the truck because he wants the truck. He doesn't want a bunch of sure, pain sure. and blood and guts all over the place. And right, then right. I hear the other side, somebody trying to get in. I had locked the door as soon as, I, every time I, I'm always pissing on the side of the road. It doesn't matter, but uh, this is, well, the guy starts to pull, point the gun down. I'm like, okay, he's going to try and, but he thinks he's going to scare me with pulling the trigger and shooting it at the ground. No sooner did he fire, I'm, the engine's running. I dumped it into drive and stomped on it, pulling nice. away. And I, I'm, looking at the diesel pumps and I'm like, can't, can't get the door shut. I'm pulling and pulling on the door and I'm thinking, where's the gun? Where's he? Is it his arm in the door? Is it his head? I hope. And you know, and I'm 
can't and, and I gotta squeeze through this spot and I can't get the door shut. And <laughs> I make it through and I look down and it's my prosthetic leg is stuck in the oh. door. <laughs> I, just, I start laughing. We're just talking about that. We were just talking about how you you're never sometimes you don't know where it is. Yeah, and you don't right, know where, like, exactly. what's going on. <laughs> I'm laughing and, and these people that were at the bus, now I'm just going around them. I slowed it down and my their eyes were big as their mouths open, their eyes are huge. They, they <laughs> just heard a gunshot. Somebody screeching out across the park, parking lot and gravel and then hits the, the cement on the diesel pump side and coming right at them. And but I stopped, you know, I slowed down and just kind of went around. And I, I think I get more, my heart gets going more talking about it than it actually happened. I'm like, why am I not, uh, you know, pumping and you know I, my my heart's fine i'm calm and i thought well okay there's a checkpoint at the other end of this town with the police I, i'm not gonna say a word about this i want to get out of here and get going but uh yeah yeah <laughs> it's, it's uh get your distance out of there yeah that guy that dumbass just probably his buddies like you sucker we could have that truck and <laughs> yeah that was that's the only incident i've had and and but i've heard of a lot of bad things and, and i don't know fact and fiction and and what's all involved you know usually there was a carjacking of an american uh he was coming to tucson and he lived uh oh shoot probably another 50 to 100 no nah, about 110 12 miles somewhere in that area north of where i just happened and, and uh he was found missing and they went looking they found his truck at a car wash and it turns out these two 18 year old little wannabe hoodlums uh took it at gunpoint he left at four in the morning to go to tucson and uh they found told where his body was in this ravine but they wanted to prove to their uncle that they could you know be a badass or whatever but the police saw the truck in a car wash right in santa Ana and uh good busted him of course and, and uh covered the body but that's that's it was, he yeah. was in his late 70s too that's a brand new truck and my truck's pretty i think it's pretty hot looking but uh it, four by four 2500 it's leveled it's not lifted but it's got some oversized tires and custom wheels and uh it attracts attention and uh, i mean like that's like that other guy i mean you to the to the to the unknowing you may look like sort of an easy target because you're an older kind of guy, but they didn't realize that you're, you know, you're not somebody to be messed with. You know, they, they, they made a mistake that day. I, you know. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 I'm not, I wasn't giving up. <laughs> I was going to get, get going. I, uh, yeah, I, I stopped there for gas one or two maybe times, but every time I go by there, I'm looking back there and see if I see that clown that, <laughs> Now, I can't even remember. He wasn't that big. I do remember that. And that yeah. gun seemed really big in his hand. And it was a piece of crap. It, it, it was a, it was a, it was a, I don't know what brand, but it was a 45 auto. And it, and it clanked. Was, he was pointing me to get out. And he's like waving it. And it <laughs> clank, clank. probably didn't even, like, yeah. Oh, this thing might blow up in his hand. <laughs> was yeah. Sorry, son of a bitch. But, yeah, but on that whole, I didn't. That's I good, never man. have had problems, and 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 I other than that, and I I travel at night. I do not like yeah. crossing that desert in the daytime. It's hot. It's boring as hell after a while after doing it so much. And I got almost twenty years. 20, I got twenty years on it. So I'm thinking, and seventeen in this house it used to be in Mossetland before. Wow. That was a two day drive, and uh, yeah, it's nine hundred and. Just over 900 miles wow. to Mazatlan from Tucson. That's so, a hike. You know, that's a. It was nice living there, but you get up and back, and you know they can't mail medicines and stuff. But yeah, they you can't buy some yeah, of the yeah. stuff that I take down there. That's the only reason I go. I used to have motorhomes. I've been through three of them now, but I, I sold after last year my second my other knee replacement, and I 
and said, oh, I'm not going to be up here anymore. This is, you know, if I come up, it'll be quick yeah. down and dirty, get out. <laughs> and not so much. I've <laughs> had to come up here to get a new prosthetic oh, and that's like four weeks. And uh, I just can't dry camp over at the uh, DM uh, RV park and uh, where I used to stay anyway and keep my RV back in storage. Uh, and then when I come up, I drive it over and plug in and hook up. And um, but uh, yeah, to do it to do a build, it's about four weeks. Uh, you get cast and a test socket, and, and that socket's checked, and then they read if you have to redo it. It, it, it's a, it's basically wow. four appointments once. Yeah, a week. and you don't want to go back and forth the whole time. No, it's it's too expensive. But, you know, oh, especially yeah. now with the gas, it's, it, it costs three hundred dollars regardless to get up here, um, right. just to come to Tucson. Yeah, I'm going to be driving that truck up. Uh, hope to leave by Monday. I've got a couple things I want to do, and I'm going to go ride later on. The weather's perfect here. It'll start raining Monday, so I'll be packed and ready to go tomorrow and bug out early Monday to go up to Colorado. Yeah, talk a little bit about that real quick. Um, I know John Knipe, he's having a, a, a reunion kind of a thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good buddy of his, uh, John Barney, who lives over uh, just east of Kansas City, um, is going. wanted to go up there, and they did a fundraiser through the association webpage people donated some money for their because Dale Spiller who lives in Ohio is coming to pick him up in the van Dale's paralyzed in the waist down and John's in a wheelchair or a little motor scooter uh, oh yeah I think I just saw a picture of those guys on Facebook yeah yeah, yeah great yeah. picture I was yeah, yeah. good I'm happy I'm not sure where they were at on their trip but <laughs> they're yeah. supposed to be up there month by Monday I think there's awesome. bad weather across Kansas and Colorado. Like I said, John, when I talked to him two days ago, he said two foot of snow just fell and the power was off. And oh no, <laughs> it's, you know, I was packing fly rods and camping gear. I was going to fish up there while I was there and fish on the way back. And I go to LA the next weekend for a, a motorcycle uh, anniversary party for Aztec Riders Motor Motorcycle Club, and uh, I was going to just keep riding, but gosh, it seems like the weather's turned to stew everywhere. Yeah, yeah. We're, I'm going to stop in Aztec at a friend's house. He used to be a crew chief on In fact, I met him through Healing Waters, Project oh, Healing yeah. Waters guy. He's a guide on the San Juan River and experienced. To oh, man. What a, he's a fly fishing guru. Yeah. And Jerome Gaddis, he's, he's uh, re not retired, uh, but he's a veteran f-16 mechanic uh crew chief or whatever they're called and okay uh, but uh yeah he's been on that river and up uh, all around durango and pa paragosa and wins a lot of tournaments and stuff and i'm gonna stay with him a day or two and then proceed on to divide nice he's on a lake all the rivers are they're just unfishable it's so much runoff from all the rain and snow this year oh yeah so be just doing some he's on a lake and and uh, i guess they're catching some big bass in there and some big crappie fly rods and that's always fun take a small a lightweight fly rod and catch a big fish that's always <laughs> fun and now i got my truck i take everything <laughs> oh right right yeah yeah i'll bet you'd be limited if you're gonna ride the bike out there right? yeah yeah I was, I was working that you know before talking to john i'm like planning and how i'm gonna pack everything my tent and fly rods and fishing gear small amount of you know flies you know they don't take a whole lot of room up but the rods i take two always in case one breaks or something happens sure. i would carry a four weight and a five weight all the time nice yeah that's that's gonna be a good time up there you call it you know john's got a beautiful place and it's perfect for this kind of a get together he's got a big uh I don't want to say barn is a big building with the bar in it and all kinds of trophy racks on the walls and nice. It's it's a beautiful place. He's got yeah. gun ranges. He's got long range. He's got pistol range. Oh, really? That's awesome. He was a he was a guide, uh, elk hunting guide for years. So he's oh, okay. He, he knows those mountains well, and uh, 
has all the equipment. He said he's setting up a GP large and uh, got a heater. I was going to bring my diesel heater and my uh, tent and bring a, I got a small cot like that. It'll be yeah, a good time, be a good everybody time. going. I hope everybody still shows up that, you know, weather. Yeah, with that weather rolling in. Yeah, it's a big deal. It's got a, got a bar inside and got yeah. a pool, pool table in there. And, you know, it's a lot of, it's just camaraderie. And sure. For sure. Good to see John Barney. I hadn't seen him in about five years. A bunch of us met up in Lawrence, Kansas, and were riding around for a week. And that nice. was a good time. Yeah, those reunions are always a good time. Just seeing guys that you didn't necessarily forget about, but reestablishing those connections is, is, is cool. It's like you haven't missed a day either. Right. You pick up, it's He's pick up where you left off, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I saw, when he told me uh, there's snow, uh, all that snow, and I'm wanting to ride. I'm like, yeah, maybe I ought to just go across town to shenanigans over at Fort Walton the same weekend. <laughs> I've been to that before, too. Yeah. That's always a good time, but... Yeah. I was like, nah, I'll see these guys and go up yeah. there. Be a long ride back to L.A. from Fort Walton Beach next oh, yeah. the next week. And, <laughs> and, uh, so I just did the Baja, rode all the way down and back up. And we were supposed to be on a ferry. Did I tell you this before? Uh-uh. Nope. Oh, no, shoot. I just came back from that two weeks ago. Oh, yeah? Uh, went down. I've been to Mazatlan, to Mo- the Semana de Moto bike week in Mazatlan, that was my 20th time there. And, and of course, living there, I was a member of the club there. But uh, anyway, the, the plan was to ride down to Cabo, spend a couple of days in Cabo, get on the ferry, go over to Mazatlan, then come up the mainland to Alamos, park my bike and take the bus up and get my truck out of uh, Tucson by hook and crook because you're only allowed one vehicle in mexico oh is that right you get a permission and i've got <laughs> somehow i'm ending up with two permissions all of a sudden and <laughs> i was gonna take advantage of it so yeah i don't know how it went through but it did one is only sonora and the other is all of mexico my okay. bike is all of mexico so that's good but uh so the ferry crumped so <laughs> we took the money from that and more jumped on a plane four of us and flew over to Mazatlan oh. for bike week <laughs> that was met up with my girl and uh, had a good four days and, and uh, flew back on a Sunday night and I had to be in Tucson on Wednesday and we made these other three that I'm riding with they go to LA and you know, halfway up the Baja they were going to split off and surprised me when they the morning uh before we were going to split later on they said hey we talked about it last night and we're going to ride with you in case anything happens uh you know if you you know if your bike or our bike if we're all together it's easier if something if there's a problem oh yeah for I sure said, okay that's cool brother yeah so that day i rode from uh it's uh Rosalita, let's see, Santa Rosalita on the, the Baja. And the, it took uh, eight, it was 811 miles to get to mm. Tucson and rode it all. And if Jeez. I think if I was um, by myself, I'd have stopped too many times and never made my time. Because the next day I, I got in at three. And the next day I had a um, uh, uh, be an appointment at 9.15, it's a 15-minute window for a state to get something certified. It's, I've waited five weeks to do this, oh paperwork to get certified, a, a pastille. And uh, so I uh, made it, made it to the appointment, got the paperwork, and I don't think those guys hadn't about, you know, one to ride with me. I don't think I'd have made the time. That's a long way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a, like endurance racing there. Yeah, endurance riding. Crazy. I don't, I don't want to do that again. I, that's <laughs> no doubt. Uh, yeah, it's all fun and games, and and then you have to haul ass. <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, listen, I I don't want to take any more of your time, and no. I'm so honored 
Oh, a lot of the guys I came up with, you know, you got, we look up to you guys and I'm, I can't thank you enough for being on here. Well, I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you came back on and talked about this other stuff too. That was really, I'm, I, I should have brought it up before that. So that's my fault. I've no, brought. I failed too. I had it on my notes and it just kind of blah, blah, blah too much anyway. So I am honored to be here because you guys, you start saying that we did this or that, but man, you guys did all the hard work in the last 23 years. Gosh, dang. You know, I, I told you I was, was following it, living in Monsetlon, following every bit of it. And it was it was torment to see what was going on and not be there. And yeah. uh, if it just been a little bit, uh, if it would have happened, you know, not that we wanted it to happen, obviously, on, you know, 9-11 or whatever. But had it happened a little sooner, it, you know, it's just uh, like I said, like like we were talking about before, it's like right place, right time, wrong place, wrong time, you know, just, yeah. you, know, yeah, it's just you never. You guys are the heroes and, and you're my heroes. And I really appreciate all the people you've had on that. Let me, oh, let me bring up something. Um, sure. Buddy of mine from back in the days of being at Station at Panama, uh, Enrique Saw, he passed away from cancer last fall or last August, actually. Uh-huh. Um, he was Academy grad. He was a class president. Uh, he's a wrestler, um, he, he, man of many talents. B-52 pilot, retired. I've been, we've been buddies and, and family, f- friends forever. And uh, he uh, was they were gonna do an intern, intern his ashes at the academy. I didn't know they had a, uh, I guess some kind of, if you're a grad, you can get buried oh, there wow. or intern there. I never knew this. And I didn't either. And they wanted a B-52 flyover, and they're having problems. And so Pete Donnelly, who you've had on here, Colonel Donnelly, he, man, that guy is something. He is awesome. an amazing awesome man. man. Uh, I contacted him because we helping him at one point with some medicines. He's uh, oh man, he went to bat for me and made some calls and trying to get this B-52 flyover. And uh, then he got General Langaria involved oh, and, right on. and both those guys have been caught all the way up the pentagon all the, everything yeah. that weekend in june is uh the, when, it, when did obama they made that holiday juneteenth or something yeah, whatever june it's called right. it, yep. three-day weekend it's a no flop the, 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 it's like family day at one of the uh, wings and anyway the airfields are closed the guard said they'd fly it out of there but the runway is closed and, you know, just a, a lot of people working to scramble and, and uh, General Canton and all kinds of folks have got involved in this just from me talking with Pete. And what a guy. Anyway, they, they're not going to be able to do it. And uh, Kike oh. is a big supporter of the he, Enrique. They call him Kike. Um, amazing story of amazing man. But anyway, he was a guy. He was big with the gliders and he's been an annual donator for or two donations financial to the glider program there mm-hmm. and may, may just have gliders do a flyover <laughs> i don't know what's going to happen now but it's the day before i leave for alaska and i oh. want to be at this thing so bad and a friend a friend in tucson here he uh jeff mcintyre was his uh this is uh nav bombardier guy for bunch of assignments they were together and good friend and i met jeff through kk and then he he worked at raytheon also when i was here but just run up with jeff and try and get a flight back on that friday right after the ceremony well it's a shame they couldn't get a b-52 to fly over that had been perfect for that oh yeah yeah Yeah. he he was the uh he's the last with the closed reese there in lubbock where he uh retired out of he flew the last plane out of there. I was at the retirement ceremony, and he's been a corporate pilot right for three different uh, citation jets. He flies for people, and he's been in the aviation. He was, a, you know, he's a master you know, pilot. He's he's, yeah. he's got all kinds of certifications, but quite a guy. But listen, I let you go. Quit babbling here, and I thank <laughs> you again, and I thank all the heroes you have on here, and. In the, in the career field, totally, is a bunch of heroes. So. But I, I thank you very much for coming on. This is an honor, and I, I love talking to you. Your stories are fantastic. And and it's nice to, after all these years of me, you know, uh, it's nice to get to sit down and talk with you like this after, you know, having, 
just knowing about you and it's it's good to get to know you a little better now so i appreciate it i'm glad that your title is not only war story <laughs> i don't have enough war stories to tell i got a lot of air well to i found that the, the other stories are i mean the war stories are not are good they're fascinating but yeah the other stories are fun too i mean i i want to hear everything so yeah for sure uh, like I said, loner most of my life, been lone wolf, and left on the church steps. So. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. Okay, brother. Thank All you. All right, J-Mac, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, bye.